Director. Thank you, Honorable President Saunders. Caribbean Court of Justice, appellate jurisdiction, an appeal from the Court of Appeal of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Commonwealth of Dominica. Hearing of appeal in CCJ appeal, DMCV number one of 2020, between Roosevelt Skerritt, Reginald Ostry, Rayburn Blackmore, Cassius Daru, Justina Charles, Kathleen Daniel, Ian Douglas, Johnson Drigo, Colin McIntyre, Roslyn Paul, Ian Pinot, Peter St. Jean, Ivor Stevenson, Kelva Daru, Kenneth Daru, and Antoine Dufour, Edingot St. Valle, Mervyn Jean Baptiste. The court's full bench hears today's matter comprising their honors. Honorable Mr. Justice Saunders, President and the Presiding Judge. Good morning, Counsel. Honorable Mr. Justice Witt. Good morning, Counsel. Honorable Mr. Justice Anderson. Good morning, Counsel. Honorable Madam Justice Rajna Lee. Good morning, Counsel. Honorable Mr. Justice Barrow. Good morning, Counsel. Honorable Mr. Justice Burgess. Good morning, Counsel. And Honorable Mr. Justice Jamada. Good morning, Counsel. May we have the appearances, please? Thank you. Uh, may it please you, my Lord President and Honorable Justices of Appeal. Uh, my Lord and my Lady, my name is Lennox Lawrence. And together with Heather Felix Evans and Jody Luke, we appear for the appellants. We are led in this matter by Learned Senior Counsel, Mr. Anthony Astafan. May it please this honorable court. My name is Cara Schillingford, and I, along with Wayne Benjamin Marsh, represent the respondents in this matter. Yes, thank you very much, um, Mr. Astafan. Are you ready to begin? Yes, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, good morning. Uh, the appellants rely on their written submissions, but we intend to make some short submissions in the course of the hour given to us this morning. We submit that the majority judgments by, by the stroke of their pens have radically altered and fundamentally changed what was generally accepted as the law, election law of the land, the exclusive jurisdiction of the High Court that was first conferred or vested in the High Court by the 1967 Constitution, Associated States Constitution, and confirmed in the Section 40 of the 1978 Constitution. The effect of the majority judgment is that now we must go to the magistrate's court for conviction, not the high court I'm, I'm in, in relation to elected members. And after a conviction, an appeal to the court of appeal and an appeal to the CCJ, then go to the high court for an application for an order of disqualification. Madam Justice Blenman described the effect of that judgment as making a mockery of the election jurisdiction of the High Court. And Your Honors, we fully and absolutely agree with Madam Justice Blenman. The key and the core issue for the determination of your honors is what is really what really does section 41a mean and what does validly validly effected elected mean or and or undue election and undue return because the majority said that an allegation or complaint of the corrupt practice of treating was not a matter which concerned the election jurisdiction of the court, 
because the complaint in the magistrate court did not raise the issue of disqualification. Well, that is a, as, 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 as largely written a constitutional heresy as one will get in the election jurisdiction of the court. Because the inevitable consequence of any finding of a corrupt practice, whether in relation to a non-elected person or an elected person, is, the, is, is disqualification for, from the parliament. So, Mr. Asifan, um, are you saying that the offense of treating is not one that can be tried by a magistrate's court? Not in relation to a member of parliament. I see. So that the offense, the acknowledge that the offense exists, that it is a summary jurisdiction offense, but if the person who is being charged is a sitting member or a prospective member of parliament that that person gets special treatment? Well, that is what the respondents were in fact arguing and the Court of Appeal of Health. But it's not a matter of special treatment. The, the constitutions of 1967 and 1978 vested the exclusive jurisdiction to determine whether or not somebody was duly elected or not. And they vested that... Wait, 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 wait. You, you're losing me, Mr. Asifan. You, you, you're losing me. I, I thought that this summary jurisdiction offence had very little to do intrinsically with disqualification because it is an offence that can be committed by any person. And the penalty for the offense is a fine or imprisonment. But somehow in your submissions and in your oral submissions so far, all I'm hearing is as if this offense is to be linked inextricably with the procedure and the substance of an election petition. And you, you've lost me there. Well, my Lord, maybe I should get to that issue now and deal with the issue. Well, then what does validly, validly elected or on a due return or result mean? In the House of Assembly Election Petition Act, and under Section 40 of, of the Constitution. My Lord, if we had looked first at the House of Assembly Act, which is starts off at page 1058 of page 1361, and we go to the issue of election petitions at Section 65, of the Act at page 1100. They say a petition complaining of an undue return or undue election of a member of the House of Assembly in this Act called an election petition may be, pres may be presented to the High Court by any one or more of the following persons. And the person's names are, are listed there. In section 66 of the Act, it says the election petition shall be tried by the High Court and after the hearing, the judge is to make a report whether or not the election has been vo void or the person duly elected. And at section 68, 1A, the election act makes specific reference and actually provides for a petition to be filed within 21 days and in relation to an election an allegation of corrupt practice upon the making of a return and specifically alleges a payment of money. That petition is to be filed within 28 days. And the election petition rules, I'm sorry, the disqualification, the House of Assembly Disqualification Act, 
which was is at page 1138 of the records, specifically provides and separates for the first time in 1967 to recognize that a person would be disqualified, not just on conviction of committing the offense, but if he is reported guilty of such offense by the court trying an election petition. And we submit that the legislature in 1967... Um, Mr. Asifan, in the, can, can you just pause a minute? Is the language of that disjunctive? Yes. It's either or, right? It's either or. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, sorry, go on. Well, it is either or for the very simple reason, Your Honor, that in 1967 was the very first time the jurisdiction was vested in the High Court to determine whether or not an elected member was duly qualified to sit in the House, validly elected to sit in the House. And we will submit through the analysis of the legislation and the rules that this included the determination to hear and determine by the High Court whether or not that individual elected member of the House committed the electoral, um, the corrupt practice of, of bribery or treating, and what the consequence of that finding was. Now, we will note that this is a jurisdiction vested in the High Court, and you have the summary jurisdiction vested in the, in the Magistrates Court. Parliament did not impose any penal consequences in Dominica for a report of guilt of committing the corrupt practice other than the one of disqualification. And we have relied on the case of Ram to say that the legislative framework for determining the election of elected members is vested exclusively within the jurisdiction of, 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 of the the parliament and the reason why it was required to have it in the disjunctive because it is possible that somebody who is not elected may have committed the offense and would have been found guilty by the magistrate's court and would thereafter be disqualified for seven years from being qualified to be elected to, to the parliament. And what about so, the other penal aspects of the criminalization of the offense? Is it that an MP, if you are right, then when it is a sitting MP post-election, your argument is it has to be brought by petition within 28 days. That's your argument, right? No, I'm yes. not sure what, you, I don't know what your honor means by post-election. Okay, you mean election the petition, petition? Yes, the election petition can only be brought after the election, right? Correct, correct. Good. You are saying that corrupt practice includes treating, and in the case of an MP, we have to say an elected MP, an election petition must be brought if the allegation is treated. Yes? Yes. 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 Great. Great. Does that therefore mean that the only consequence for an MP who is, let us hypothetically, found to be guilty of treating can be the election petition outcome, i.e. disqualification. If the only route is through the High Court petition for an MP, then the only outcome is disqualification or removal, etc. My question is, if that is correct, what about the criminal consequences of the, of the act, i.e. there are fines, etc., terms of imprisonment that are possible under Section 59? Is it that the I, MP is exempt from those criminal, uh, from the from the criminal consequences of that conduct? Well, I wouldn't say exempt from the penal consequences. Our position is that by removing the jurisdiction from the magistrate and vesting it in the High Court in relation to elected members, Parliament would would, would have been required to make some legislative changes to the Act to provide for penal consequences if, in fact, Parliament intended or contemplated penal consequences to flow. Because 
But absent it, those, Mr. Asifan, we, we don't, don't have those. The first point. There's no, There's penal, no penal consequence. All right. No. So that's There's what not. I'm saying. Absent those, which is our which is our facts now, there are no penal consequences for an MP who is quote unquote guilty of of, of treating. Not guilty because an election petition is not determining anything to do with criminal guilt. An election petition is doing a very different thing. But the consequence of your argument is the MP gets a free pass in relation to penal consequences for his, her, or their conduct. Yes? Well, I, 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 the use of the word free pass is, is a troubling one for us because it's not. Parliament, Parliament has provided a, a regime which this court and other courts have said uh, we are required to, to file historically election corrupt practices have always been dealt with by the, the, the High Court through the process of the election petition. We are not aware of any election of any criminal complaint in a magistrate's court against an elected member for corrupt practice or for, of, or for whether treating or bribery. And there has to be a fundamentally strong policy reason for that. It was never contemplated. That, that, that elected members should be subjected to the magistrate's jurisdiction. And, and in addition to the penal consequences that your honor mentioned, be also subjected to disqualification because section 61, un, until amended by the 67 constitution and by the disqualification act, included the question of disqualification for, for members, for, for persons convicted in the magistrate's court we are submitting, the core of our case is that if the consequence of a conviction is disqualification, that is a disqualification to be sitting in the House of Assembly in the Parliament. It goes to the root of your election. It goes to whether you were validly elected, elected because a corrupt practice like fraud vitiates everything. So if, in fact, the consequence of a magistrate's decision is that you must leave the, of the, the, the elected after the, the, the appeal to the CCJ, um, you, mu you must leave the office and impacting on your right to sit in the parliament, we are submitting that when you look at it from that perspective as well, that jurisdiction as to whether you should sit in the house should not belong in the hands of the magistrate, but belong in the hands of the high court. As Madam Justice Bledman said, and there are good reasons for that. There are good reasons for that, my lord. If I may just put this aside and refer to my notes shortly. The, the, the constitutional and electoral principles that govern the election jurisdiction of the court is expedition, is uncertainty, a condition precedence to be filed for the purposes of an election petition. Under section 40 of our constitution, there is no right of appeal to go to the CCJ from a conviction in the magistrate's court, which has the consequence of disqualifying a member from the House. But if this judgment stands, all of the constitutional principles of which we are concerned, whether or not there were penal consequences, will go by the wayside. Expedition. There will be this uncertainty hanging over the parliament for five years, two years. You will go from one election to the next, with this case hanging up in the High Court, in the Magistrate's Court, possibly tried by a lay magistrate, not, not a member of the, of the independent High Court Judiciary Court of Record. You have a right of appeal to the CCJ from a conviction in the Magistrate's Court. You don't have a right of con to appeal to the CCJ from a determination of the election court. So all of these constitutional issues all of these constitutional issues are of fundamental importance for the court's determination as to whether or not there are penal consequences, whether parliament and the, and the constitutional drafters contemplated that the exclusive jurisdiction was as, as, as stated in, in RAM. It cannot be, your honors, it cannot possibly be that simply because penal consequences are not provided for, that we can disregard the disqualifying effect of a conviction or report and suggest that all of the protections for the integrity of a, of a parliament's 
certainty and expeditious determination should be put on the side simply because it appears to some that politicians or elected members are being given a free ride. Mr. Okay, but, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Justice Barrett. Mr. Sofan, um, Section 32 of the Constitution intrigues me in relation to what you're saying. Because it says, if it is so provided by Parliament, a person who is convicted by any court of law, I emphasize any court of law, and I emphasize convicted, of any offense that is prescribed by Parliament and that is connected with the election of members, and then, or who is reported guilty of such an offense by the court trying an election petition, call it an election court, shall not be qualified for such period as the case following his conviction or as the case may be following the report of the election court to be elected or appointed as a member. So section 32 of the constitution expressly contemplates two courses which lead to disqualification. Conviction by any court, not by the High Court, by any court, or the report of an election court, which is the High Court, that the person has been guilty of such an offense. So either course leads to disqualification. Therefore, yes, either course is available. Well, 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 Your Honor, we disagree with that fundamentally. We we have argued in 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 the past and in this case that Section 32.3 actually creates a dual process where persons who are not elected would be convicted by the magistrate and forever and for the period of seven years not be eligible to be elected in any election, town council, village council, national elections, and so on. But coming with this Section 32.3. As we say, is the paramount is the paramount provision. What council of, may may I be permitted to get clarification from you here? Sure. Because you are saying that this does not apply to an elected person, but there's not anything which, as a matter of fact, um, the conviction. Following his conviction, this is the person who is disqualified, shall not be qualified for such period following his conviction to be elected or appointed as a member. No, um, Your Honor, I think it was in I, Ifran, Ifran Ali. The, the CCG said that, that these provisions of the Constitution must not be read in isolation and should be read sub harmoniously with other provisions of the Constitution. Yeah. Our position is that, that that provision provided a dual process for persons who are not elected, who are not subject to the election jurisdiction of the High Court, and persons who are elected to the jurisdiction of the High Court, and that in the interpretation of these provisions, including 32.5 and 30, 32, the ones that you mentioned in 35, came the paramount, came the paramount obligation, the, the paramount provision in section 40 of the constitution. And, and if these provisions are being interpreted in isolation and not harmoniously with section 40 of the constitution, which vested an exclusive jurisdiction to hear and determine any question it means it means that all of the election principles recognized by this court in Ali Ifran, Ifran Ali and Ram, that I, as a disgruntled supporter or person who lost an election, could simply decide to ignore the, the, the provisions of the House of Assembly Elections Act, the requirement for expedition of 21 days or 28 days, put aside the requirement for election petitions. 
and wait within a period of six months when I have a dispute with the government and said, you know what, I had enough of this government. The time has come for me to go to the magistrate's court. And in this case, charge every single member of the cabinet that was elected by the parliament some five months and something after the constitution, the effect, the elections, the effect, the effect of that, the effect of that is to fundamentally underline the separation of powers principles or and or the election principles of expedition and certainty in elections. And I am suggesting, I am respectfully submitting to your honors that rather than take a, a legalistic or a, little, a linguistic approach to the interpretation of the Constitution, it must be construed within the overriding principles of the election law, expedition, certainty, and, and, and so on. I mean, the, the process. Mr. Mr. Stefan, Mr. Stefan, you will be pleased to know that I got very clearly that that is the thrust of your submission. We well, very well, well, thank you for that, because the consequences on an elected parliament would, if, 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 if the, the my, my majority judgments are correct, the uncertainty that would affect our democracies and our constitutional role of government are mind-boggling. And, and there are times when a court, Your Honor, I submit respectfully to this honorable court, that there comes a time when the court needs to look at the picture holistically, the, 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 the contextual constitutional principles that have governed elections in this, con in, in this country and, 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 and not find a reason simply because a, a conviction was not provided for election members or a penal consequence to, to undermine and to override and to repudiate the fundamental principles of certainty. Sorry, Mr. Astafan. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, I think the press, the honourable president, um, uh, raised the question with you, which suggests that um, uh, we are concerned to some extent with um, the provision in sections 56 and 59 of the election, the House of Assembly Elections Act. That that really is where everything begins. Uh, uh, given your uh, very learned expose on the uh, constitutionality of, of um, uh, an election petition and so on. Uh, I, I take it that you are going to. I take it that you are going to comment on the constitutional validity of uh, Section 56, because if Section 56 does not suffer uh, the fate of unconstitutionality or what have you. You're going to be forced to. You are going to be forced to explain what Section uh, 56 means. Section 56, which talks about every person, and unless you're going to create an exception in respect of that, if it, if it remains, if Section 56 remains valid constitutionally, and this is what is before us, I, I didn't get the impression that it, the. Uh, section 40 of the Constitution or any other provision in the Constitution was before uh, the court in a direct way. The direct question was raised in respect of um, uh, sections 56 and 59. But uh, so far, I haven't heard you attempt to explain your case against that backdrop, which is the essential backdrop. But of course, I suspect you're going to get there. Well, well Your Honor, to, to, to correct the record, Council representing the respondents con conceded in the hearing before the Court of Appeal that we had front frontally raised the, is the constitutional issues in our issues for the court to be determined as a question of law. Sorry, 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 Mr. Asafan, I'm not saying that you didn't, you didn't raise the issue, the co constitutional issues, because uh, uh, I think that the judgment of um, uh, Justice of Appeal Blenman makes it clear. She re she recites the history of um of the arguments in respect of whether the constitu constitutional matters were raised or not. But that's not the question I'm raising with you. The question I'm raising with you is that the funds at Arigo, if you look at the beginning of the thing, it starts with a complaint which is made uh, under section 56 uh, and which has uh, 
which has to be read in light of Section 59. The Section Section 56 does not say subject to uh, any of the other provisions on the question of validity. Well, what, I think that the question which I'm raising with you, uh, Mr. Estefan, is this. Uh, how does this court treat with that essential point, which is which, which I think the president raised with you, is the every person in um in section 56 is that is that does that exclude uh, members of of the of the of the assembly or or uh, no. persons who will become members of the assembly or does every person mean what it ordinarily means? Every person. That's the that's well, the question. I, 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 I understand what you mean now, Your Honor. This the legislation that you're referring to is a 1951 legislation. It was draft, it was passed by the assembly in the 16th of July, 1951, when Dominica was a colony. In the first constitution that we had was the Associated States Constitution of 1967. That constitution is found, <clears throat> and I appreciate the point, Your Honor, so I would just like an opportunity to, to find it in the jungle of papers that I have. The, the, first, the first constitution that we had following the, the House of Assembly Act that was passed in 1951 was the 1967 constitution. That should be found at page, it starts off at page 1589 of 1657. It provides, frankly, the same language as, as was seen in 1978. But in section 32 of that 67 constitution, it vested exclusive jurisdiction in the high court to hear and determine any question whether any person has been validly, elect, validly elected as an elected member. And then he goes on, that's at page 1616, and he goes on at paragraph chapter 9, page 59, the, elect, the existing laws, that's at section 101 of that constitution, shall as from the commencement of this constitution be construed with such modifications adaptations, qualifications, and exceptions as may be necessary to bring them into conformity with the West Indies Act, this constitution, and the, and the court's order. The 1978 constitution, Your Honor, constitution, has the very same provisions, and in the second schedule to the constitution, which we had to email up, section 117, section 117 of that constitution says that um, the supreme law of the land is the constitution. The second schedule to that constitution, which is found at page 2353 of 2360, also requires existing laws to be construed with such modifications, adaptations, qualifications, etc. We respectfully submit that in the light of the constitutional mandate on existing laws, to construe the House of Assembly Act in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution, which respectively vested exclusive jurisdiction in the High Court. We cannot and should not read the House of Assembly Elections Act in isolation. It must be read subject to the provisions of the Constitution. Uh, uh, Mr. And, Stephen, I, I, I get your point, but could you help us to see how you would read Section 56? No, given, uh, given your... Uh, uh, exploration of the constitutional, the history of constitutional development in Dominica, in the Commonwealth of, Dom, of Dominica, how would you suggest uh, that Section 56 should be read? Because Section 56 is where the uh, issues arise. This is the foundation, the, the fountain of everything which is before us. No. So, so uh, how, how, how should we read uh, Section 50, 56? In light of the constitutional um, principles well, that you've just Adam rated. In, in in light of the constitutional provisions that I've just enumerated, and and in view of the provisions also of section sixty-five to sixty-eight of the Act itself, that specifically makes references for corrupt practices to be taken to the High Court by election petition. 
All that is required is that any person can be construed to mean any person. Was it section 56, Justice Bridges? Can, can I just get it? Yeah, any person there, in, 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 including, including elected members, shall be deemed guilty if so found by the High Court in the exercise of its election jurisdiction under the Constitution. So you, you, you're saying that the election petition process can be transformed into a criminal process? No, what I'm saying, Your Honor, is that the Parliament has given the election court authority to make findings of fact that somebody committed a criminal offense. What's the, and, what's, what's the standard of proof in the elections petition court, Donna, in the election I'm, court? I'm glad that you've asked me that question. Um, unfortunately, I have to give it to you as an officer of the court. Mr. Mendes and I have had this from Trinidad, has had this fight for years. I have said stand beyond a reasonable doubt. He has said beyond the balance of probability. The Privy Council in a case out of Mauritius said it should be the beyond, it should be in relation to, to bribery, it should be beyond a reasonable doubt. But we have Jewish decisions from our jurisdiction, which is the OECS jurisdiction from whence I'm from, that speaks to the balance of probability. But the more serious the allegation, like bribery or treating, the greater the burden of proof and the greater the standard of proof and so on. But okay, what, what, okay, so it, it, it seems to be a, a little bit up in the air. But the, what is tr troubling me is that a process that I instinctively always conceived as being a civil process. I am hearing you to say that it can be used, it must be used as a criminal process to try a criminal offense that has been prescribed by parliament and which parliament has created a particular criminal procedure for, namely some jurisdiction before the magistrate. Your Honor, um, my, your, my, my Lord President, let's, let, 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 let's go back a bit. The case law that we have put before you says that these were a peculiar parliamentary jurisdiction, which parliament has assigned to the high court. That is the issue of whether someone has been validly elected. Y yes, yes, but hear, hear me out, my Lord President. But including, including in that ex jurisdiction is the fact that our courts, our Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Mr. Justice Rollins and other prominent jurists from the Eastern Caribbean have all said that a corrupt practice is one committing of, a, of, 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 of an election practice goes to the heart and to the soul of whether the election process was lawful. And the only judicial authority that the parliament and the constitutional drafters felt sufficiently confident in to make a determination which has the effect of changing a parliament and elected members was to vest that hybrid, peculiar, not civil or criminal, hybrid or peculiar jurisdiction in the high court to preserve the integrity of governance with strict time limits and so on. For example, as early as 1978, the election, the, 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 our court of appeal in Radix versus Gary, that's at page 15149 of 1585. Radix versus Gary, Court of Appeal, the decision of justice, Dave Morris Davis, Chief Justice. Page 556, letter G to H, page 1552 of 1585. In my view, the election of a candidate can be avoided only upon proof of an election offense committed by the candidate or upon proof of some irregularity. So it is since 1978, our Court of Appeal has recognized 
the hybrid peculiar jurisdiction of the High Court to make determinations as to whether, in fact, somebody committed a corrupt, corrupt practice and what the consequences are. It's, it's not a criminal jurisdiction because matters of irregularities with voting and counting are not matters that go to the criminal law. This is consistently been described over the, since Associated State was by our courts and this CCJ as a hybrid peculiar parliamentary jurisdiction assigned to the High Court. Justice Rollins, Justice Rollins, yeah, um, Your Honours, if I may take you to two of the, 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 the sections, paragraphs of, of, of the judgment of, of Justice Rollins that I find absolutely spot on and of, would be of considerable assistance to the, to, to the court. Paragraph 16, page 1562 of 1585. He says the rationale for the foregoing statements, which are similar to the ones, my Lord President, that you referred to in, in RAM, is that provisions for litigation of election petitions are matters of substantive law, unlike the statute of limitation cannot be dispensed with by the court. Moving forward, persons who are returned as elected should know quickly whether they have been validly elected, lawfully elected. The con lawfully elected will include the commission of a corrupt practice offense. The country, the country needs to know who these elected petitions are with certainty, similarly to your judgment in RAM. Election challenges should be mounted before a new legislature sits or begins its work as soon as possible thereafter in order that the legislature may be definitively lawfully constituted. It goes to the issue of legitimacy Electoral laws, this is what Justice Rollins said, election laws and their interpretation by the courts are intended to facilitate this. An interpretation that says an, a, a, an elected member must, because of an, the, the, the colonial language in an act, must go to the magistrate's court and drag on for five years and ending with an appeal before the CCJ, which otherwise would not be possible undermines the issue of legitimacy that Justice Rollins is speaking of. And then he goes on at paragraph 19 of the judgment, which is the next page, where we had argued before him what is required to set aside an election. And he says, additionally, under the election laws of Dominica, court may void an election where it finds there was an undue election or an undue return. These terms are not defined. That's at page 1563 of our submissions records, Your Honor. However, the tests which are well established in the cases cited in the foregoing paragraph were succinctly captured by Sir Maurice Davis in Radix Gary. In summary, they stated that an order could be made by a fresh election upon proof of an election offense committed by a candidate. So since 1978 and confirmed again in 2005, our courts, as including the, the election court in Dominica, have said that it is for the High Court to determine the election offense to see whether or not he was validly and legitimately um, elected. And if we ignore this, Your Honours, if we ignore this learning, if we ignore this learning and leave it to the magistrates to decide where after five years there's a consequence of disqualification imposed by statute. I mean, what are we saying? Are we, by this interpretation, transferring the key issue of legitimacy and lawfulness of our government to the magistrate's court? Or as the, the, the Court of Appeal says, they must then convict and then send the issue of legitimacy back to the High Court after the appeal to the CCJ is open? Your Honours, I'm sorry, but that's a bizarre conclusion for the court majority court to have come to. It undermines the foundation of the election law. And I, I wish to just go back again to another decision of our Court of Appeals, which is the, the loftus Jura matter, loftus Jura judgment at page 1391 of the record. You see, my Lord, what, what we are concerned of from the appellants 
that this legalistic interpretation or tabulated legalism without regard to the overriding constitutional objective of elections and election jurisdiction court is going to cause chaos. And the court should be mindful, or, or sorry, no disrespect, man, did your honor, ought to be mindful of the consequences of that decision and whether or not all of the principles accepted by this court of certainty and expedition ought to be permitted to be rough, run roughshod over by a claimant deciding to bypass the election jurisdiction of the court and go to the magistrate's court because all politicians should be subject to conviction as well. Okay, so let, let, let's deal with a hypothetical case. Um, here you have two persons. One is the promoter of the, 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 the dance or whatever. Yeah. And this is purely hypothetical and is not to reflect on the supposed facts in this case. One is the promoter or the entertainer, the other is the candidate. And more than three weeks after they were engaged in treating, the evidence came to light that they were engaged in treated. Under your argument, you can charge the promoter and have him go before the magistrate's court. But because the period of time for which an election petition would have elapsed, at the period of time um, should have been presented, would have elapsed, you you do what in relation to his co his his his, his, his co conspirator his his, his his partner in crime who is a member of the house? Well, I say, subject to to the one comment that I'm going to make, that the court ought to follow its ruling in RAM. If you don't come in time, you're dead. Except, and I must say, I found the judgment of. Mr. Justice Anderson, about a wholesale fraudulent pretext by a candidate pretending, pre, pretending to be a legitimately qualified person, but it turns out to be a, a, a Mars, somebody from Mars, who has no legitimate connection to the people or the parliament or the electorate of, of Guyana, that these would be the rare and exceptional consequences decisions that I, I could possibly go along with the judgment of Justice Anderson. But in our jurisdiction, Your Honor, Justice Rollins has confronted that decision clearly. He says, look, political parties who run elections ought to know what they're doing. They have lawyers. They must get ready. The evidence must be ready within the time prescribed by law. Please do not come to him and say, or do not come to the court, sorry, not him, come to the court and say, um, well, I found it kind of late. So disregard what Parliament says about 21 days or 28 days. Your Honor, if you don't come within the 21 or the 28 days, and unless you commit some extraordinary and vulgar fraudulent behavior like Justice Anderson was dealing with, I think that you have to go along the wayside. The two judgments of the Court of Appeal I would like to deal with before I am I either end or I'm asked to end my submission. The 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 Loftus Jura case and then the very interesting case of Wingrove, Wingrove George that came afterwards by the Court of Appeal. Your Honor, at Health Three, I know I don't have much time left, but I would like your the honor's leave to just deal with these two judgments. Section 40, this is held three in, in, in Loftus Jura, page 1394. Section 40 of the Constitution confers exclusive and ex exclusionary jurisdiction on the High Court to hear election petition. Therefore, questions which fall within the election jurisdiction of the High Court cannot be determined within the ordinary jurisdiction of the High Court in civil matters, but instead must follow the specific, but and but must instead follow the mandatory specific procedures outlined in section 40. The mandatory procedures include the stipulation that an election petition must be filed in order to commence proceedings under that section. 
Here comes the interesting words. The ordinary and grammatical meaning of Section 41A of the Constitution, read in conjunction with 65, which is the undue return on due election of the House of Assembly Elections Act, indicates that the court's election jurisdiction encompasses questions which relate to the process or the returns in each electorate and the existence of any element of unlawfulness therein. Her ladyship at paragraphs 28 and 29 of her judgment at page 1409, 1409. At paragraph 28, she asked the question, what amounts to a person, what amounts to a question whether a person has been validly elected within the terms of section 41A? Some guidance can, in our view, be gleaned from the examination of the statutory rules Parliament has prescribed for invoking the court's jurisdiction under section 41A. There is no doubt that the procedure for invoking the court's jurisdiction under section 41 primarily requires the filing of an election petition. As, election, as Davis says, in, as Davis Chief Justice stated, the means by which a per question is determined or not is by election petition. And at 29, she says, section 41 of the constitution together with section 65 it is apparent that the question of whether a person has been validly elected as, an, as a representative is a question or complaint of a due, undue or un, return or undue election of a member to the House of Assembly under Section 65. In Payne versus Adams, the High Court of New Zealand explained that a complaint of an undue election or result relates to, quote, the processes of the election or returns in each in each electorate and the existence of any element of unlawfulness which relates to these processes. It also appears that the ordinary and grammatical meaning of the both sections that the court's jurisdiction in this regard equally embraces a challenge to the election of a singular candidate, singular candidate, and the, the, the validity of an entire election return. Now, may I pause here? The only possible way under the election law that a candidate election could be set aside on the only grounds is that if he had in fact committed the corrupt practices of bribery and treating and the other matters that are set forth in there. A candidate's election, a single candidate's election would not be set aside because of irregularities during the election, because he's not a polling agent, he's a presiding officer, he's not a counting agent, he's not the returning officer, and so on. So our court is saying that the exclusive jurisdiction of the court, of the, of the high court, determines the question of the lawfulness of the conduct of a candidate. That could only mean bribery and treating. That, Your Honor, the case of Green Grove that we put in fairly late is at page 1682 of 1704. And it's a very interesting point. At held one, the election jurisdiction is a very limited jurisdiction, which relates to the validity of the election of members of parliament and the national election. The principles which apply to the election jurisdiction do not apply to every conduct a matter of conduct relating to an election. While the charges against Mr. George are related to the conduct during the, the election of members to the National Assembly, they do not in any way have the potential to affect the validity of the election of those members. Clear. If a candy, if a member of parliament is charged in the summary sense, that has a real potential of affecting his validity of his election because of a conviction by a magistrate's court and not a finding of guilt by the high court, which the high court reports to the president under section 66 of the House of Assembly Election Petition Act. And this is the language of our court. Did not, they, 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 
they did not in any way have the potential, potential to affect the validity of the election. There can be no question, Your Honours, that a criminal complaint before the magistrate's court has the serious potential in the findings of guilt of affecting the validity of the election. And we are respectfully submitting that because of Section 40 and the obligation of the courts to read the, the colonial law consistently with the provisions of the Constitution, the only court that has jurisdiction to hear and determine any matter, including a corrupt practice, that has the potential of affecting the result of the elected members is constitutionally the High Court under the provisions of Section 40 of the Constitution. Your Honours, I think my time is, my one minute is, is gone. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, one hour is gone. I don't know if there's anything else I can assist you with. We stand by our written submissions, and we ask you to look at some of the matters that we have we have cleared up, filed late, and we, we have in fact filed, refiled, sorry, Your Honours, clean copies of Hallsbury's. These are to be followed at page 1708 of 1717 to 1714. And I just read, well, I don't need to read it. I don't think I need to cite Horsby Store to the Apex Court. But it's there for you to have a look at. And we respectfully submit that Justice Benman is correct. That decision makes a mockery of the, uh, of the jurisdiction of the court. The court took an isolationist, legalistic approach to the interpretation of these provisions. They did not follow the, the dicta of Rollins on interpreting these laws within the context of the policy of certainty, legitimacy, and expedition. And they did not follow the ruling of this court, when they had, wouldn't have the time to have done it, of, of Ifran Ali. That the, these provisions must be read not out of context, but in harmony with other provisions. And we, of the country, and we submit that the paramount provision of the Constitution is Section 40, and we have set out the learning in, in our submission. Mr. Asifan, um, so if person, I'm getting back to the, the same example that I gave you. The, if the person who was not a candidate um, was proceeded with in the magistrate's court and convicted, is that person then ineligible to be a member of the House for the next seven years? He, he, would be, he would not be qualified to be elected for the next seven years. Bearing by the next election would be five. You have intermittent village elections. But qualification would... isn't a flip side of disqualification. In other words, um, I, I, this is what troubles me most about your arguments. Because Joe Blow, who in 2015 has no intention whatsoever to be a member of parliament. He is just a person who is a disc jockey and um, playing his music. But for whatever reason, he's convicted of treating. Then it would appear that inexorably, the consequence is that to 2022, even if he gets involved in politics and he wants to represent his constituency in the next election in 2019 or 2020, because of that conviction in 2015, he's ineligible. But the person who was involved in the crime with him in 2015, who happened to be a candidate and who was successful in 2015, because no election petition was filed, he essentially gets a free pass. 
how does one justify, rationalize that discriminatory treatment? Well, Your Honor, it's, it's regrettable that the word, the word discriminatory is being used because that was certainly not parliament's or the, or, or the, or the, the legislature's intent. My simple answer, Your Honor, is that Parliament and the Constitution were concerned not so much about punishing members of Parliament, but in preserving the integrity of the Parliament by disqualifying them. And if you want to disqualify, if you want to disqualify a member of Parliament from sitting in the House, so you Rollins says, be vigilant, look for the evidence, take the evidence, make notes and so on. Bring the petition, he loses, he's disqualified for seven years. So you will have a convicted member who, well, reported guilty by the High Court, who has committed these offenses, and based on the report of the High Court of Justice, will not be able to sit in the House or run in the next election, because the disqualification is not for life, it's for seven years. So my respectful answer would be, look, your honors, we can find many examples to, to try to justify um, modifying or altering or expanding the language. I, 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 I thought that you would have said to me, and I don't know whether you said it previously, that because this to me would have been more consistent, a more consistent approach that those aspects of the penalty that are provided in the magistrate's procedure, in the act that governs that whole procedure, that those penalty provisions that speak to disqualification are inconsistent with the constitutional matrix, if not the constitutional explicit provisions, and therefore, should be disregarded, should be struck down. It, it, this the, isn't the, the, to be modified to bring it into, con, into, con, in, in, into conformity with the Constitution. But you're not making that argument. Well, I'm not sure I follow what you're saying, Your Honor. Um, we are saying that the question of disqualification will apply. We have not argued, we have not argued that the penalty provisions should be modified to read that the High Court would also have had that jurisdiction in addition to imposing imposing the, the order of, of disqualification to in fact impose a sentence and fine. I mean, if that's... If, the if, if point the court, I'm making is that if, and I'm not saying that I buy that argument either, but it seems to me that to me it would be a lot more consistent with the arguments that you're presenting if one were to say that, look, the magistrate's process is one thing. The election petition process is a different separate thing and never the twain shall meet. So that you will get charged by the magistrate, you're fined or you're, con you're, you're convicted, you're fined or you're put in prison. And that's the end of that. Any other consequence in relation to the magistrate's process relating to qualification or disqualification is inconsistent with the Constitution. Now, if I had heard that argument, I would say, well, that sounds interesting. I, I, I would look at that. But, but that's not the argument that you're making. No, but I, I could I could never make such an argument because the, the, the inevitable consequence of that argument is that without without the prospect of disqualification, you have an entire cabinet being summoned to the magistrate's court on an issue that should have been properly brought before the, 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 the high court under this exclusive election jurisdiction. The disruptive effect of a magistrate having any jurisdiction over election matters in relation to election offenses committed before the that is precisely the sort of situation that undermines the constitutional electoral principles for certainty and expedition. Even if there's no consequence, it will make a mockery of the, 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 the government to have every so often the entire cabinet marching 
to the magistrate's court to await a conviction and then appeal it to the court of appeal and then appeal it to the CCJ. No, well, we, we Honor, get I don't think what you I want don't to say, Mr. Well, Estefan, because if forget election and this whole issue, if all the members in parliament or all the members on one side of parliament are accomplices or all together they, 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 they all were part and parcel of some criminal offense tribal by a magistrate. Why can't they be lining up in the magistrate's court to have be, be, that criminal well, matter heard? Well, because, Your Honor, because the compelling overriding policy position of this court, the Privy Council and other courts, is that these issues must be dealt with with certainty and expedition to have certainty and legitimacy without disruption. To, no, I, to, to I, I think for cross purposes, I, I, I am suggesting, I, 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 I am not positing an instance that relates to any election offense. The point I'm trying to get across is that the mere fact that the presence before the magistrate's court of a sitting member of parliament is required to answer a criminal offense might be disruptive of parliament or government, to my mind, is no excuse or no provides no basis for suggesting that if a sitting member of parliament is accused of a criminal offense, they must not face the consequences in the same fashion as any other citizen. We no, don't have, I don't know of any provision no. that gives immunity to parliamentarians from answering criminal charges. No, Your Honor, that's not what that's not what I said, and that's not what I meant. Well, I, I figured that. No, that's not what I meant. I mean, if if a, if a minister or member of parliament is charged with theft, with rape, with murder, with assault, with conspiracy to defraud, tax evasion, he's on the same parallel universe with everybody else. He's on the same universe. Right. We are talking about parliament in the exercise of its election jurisdiction, making a determination that one of the grounds upon which my election can be set aside is by a corrupt is by a corrupt practice, whether bribery or treaty. Yeah. And I am, we are respectfully su submitting all of these examples contribute to the debate, but it would fundamentally undermine what was the in purpose of the constitutional provisions, which is bringing an early determination to these petitions that have a potential of affecting the result, the, the, the elections of the, the, the members of parliament and the legitimacy and integrity of, of the government. And I, I respectfully submit that I don't think we should search for examples because it is, to use the language of RAM, it is precisely the exclusive under the separation of powers. It is the, Jewish, it is the authority of the parliament to decide on these matters, and that the court should tread very gingerly, including an apex court, in seeking to interfere with the arrangements parliaments have made, because I think that your language, my Lord President, was that that would be trespassing into the provinces of the parliament. If the, if, if, if the parliament intended to in, in, invoke penal consequences following a report by the high court, then, 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 then it should say so in very clear and precise terms. We should not seek to find a way through interpretation to find a way to have members of parliament convicted when the legislation provides expressly for the hearing of corrupt practices by the High Court, but which requires petitions within a specific period of time, and that jurisdiction is vested exclusively in the High Court. Okay. Could I ask... One question, uh, President. Um, very down to earth question, uh, Mr. Asafan. Uh, a prosecution on the basis of uh, 56 59, as is the case here, a complaint. Does that happen very often? It seems, I got the impression that it's rare. 
I, I have never heard of an elected member of parliament in, in the English speaking CARICOM, OECS, or Commonwealth with provisions similar to ours or the same ever being charged in the magistrate's court. On the contrary, I can tell you, Your, Your Honor, as, as an officer of the court from 1997 to 2000, all election petitions that I have dealt with, and this is from, from the bar table, have included either allegations of bribery, treating, or some other matter against the elected members of the parliament. 2014 was the very first time, very first time after a deliberate political decision by the leader of the opposition, not to file petition, but to file criminal complaints. And yes. I think the, the, the inability of the respondents to bring these cases to the forefront with provisions similar to ours is, a, is, is I think, transparent evidence to the court that that has never been the practice. And this is a novel approach to seeking to undermine the integrity of a government by filing these petitions, these complaints in the magistrate's court with the effect of the consequential effect of disqualification. And so long as the law stands as is to perhaps indirectly address the learned president, Yes, yeah, so, but, so you, you have not seen any prosecution at all on the basis of 56 and 59, even uh, against non-elected members. Do you, are you aware of this? It seems to be a, a, a rare thing. In the case of Wingrove, well, you said elected member, so the answer is no. Wingrove was not an elected member. Yes. He was the he was the chief elections officer. Yes. Uh, but uh, besides that case, you are not aware of these kind of prosecutions because it's it is a prosecution that we are talking about. No, I haven't. I have seen in judgments from Turks and Caicos of findings of bribery by by the High Court judge with the with the report on the consequence of disqualification of those who may have been involved, or, for example, in, the, in Antigua and Barbuda, if I can give the court the benefit of my, my experience. In Dominica, the, the court makes a report to the president. That's it. In Antigua and Barbuda, under the representation of the People's Act, the court makes a report to the governor general, no, the speaker of the house, and the director of public prosecution. So I got the impression from what you were saying and also from your written uh, written submissions, uh, and this probably goes uh, uh, through all the uh, argumentation of a constitutional uh, nature. Uh, what I heard you saying um, is actually, well, in this particular case, under the circumstances of this case, filing this criminal complaint while there is an election petition possibility is what the French would call a détournement de pouvoir. It, it would mean that you are using uh, a, an opportunity that the law gives um, in circumstances where you shouldn't do that. Well, yes, I agree. And 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 the reason, I, I, I agree on it, the reason why I and all, we have also taken very, a very strong position on it, is that the three allegations of treating were public concerts. And I mean, I don't think anybody could sensibly come to the court and say, well, I didn't know about these public concerts until three months after the election. These were public concerts before the election, broadcast on radio and on television. So I think it was fair to say that everybody would have had public knowledge of that, and instead of coming by way of petition, and, and, and this is why we defend this matter so vigorously, the leader of the opposition cannot cherry pick what jurisdiction he wants. He cannot, in relation to open public functions, decide he's not filing petitions. Instead, he's going to file um, criminal complaints in the magistrate's court some five months after the election. And I think that is precisely the conduct that the election jurisdiction the, the, the provisions for time limits and the constitution wanted to prevent. Yeah, well, I must say, I must admit that um, coming from a very legal, different legal system where we do not have private prosecutions, I, I 
have a problem with that idea of a private prosecution. Prosecutions in the system where I came from uh, is entirely and exclusively a matter for what you would call the DPP and not for any citizen. And in this case, the prosecutors, if you might call them, are actually political opponents. So that Correct. that that all places it in a, in a in a in a certain context. But thank you for your answers. Um, I, I just um, wanted to ask you, Mr. Astefan, whether this is not, in fact, um, a case for legislative reform. Absolutely. Um, I, I listened with very keen interest to the clarity and the force of your argument. I congratulate you on both. But it, it seems to me that you do have a, a fairly, you know, wide expanse of water to cross. And my brother, Justice Burgess, I think um, was 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 trying to get you to face that. Um, that is to say that there is the provision in Section 56, which seems to uh, allow for the for the prosecution of you know every person accused of of treating. Um, as I said, I follow your argument very very closely, and I, and I see the. Um, the incongruity, really, with the constitutional provisions which vest the exclusive jurisdiction in the High Court to determine uh, membership of, of, of the House. Um, but your job would have been made much easier, and, and I think so would ours, if the legislature had intervened um, to clarify the sense in which Parliament intended these laws to, to operate. Would you, would you not agree? Yes, in fact, I can tell you that the former president of the CCJ, Sir Dennis Byron, has been asked to conduct public hearings on election reform in, in Dominica. And I can assure you, I can assure your honors that these are all issues that are going to come up within the province of recommendations to the parliament. And that's why we see these as requirements for legislative reform, not for judicial engineering, as I as we respectfully submit the the, 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 the majority of the court did, but you're absolutely correct, Your Honor. Legislative reform is required, and the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of the Commonwealth of Dominica has made it clear that they are going to have hearings on election reform, headed by none other than Sir Dennis Byron. On a parting note, Mr. Stefan, is it within the competence of the Director of Public Prosecutions in Dominica to discontinue a prosecution by a private citizen? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes, um, I, I was very keen on that um, question as well, and I thank my brother for asking it. Yes, thank you very much. Well, you see, the problem might be, Justice Anderson, in these small islands, with, with the level of toxicity as they are, any intervention by the DPP would be construed by many as a subtle, subversive attempt by the politicians to undermine the system. And therefore, no request was made to the director of public prosecution. I can give you that assurance. That is why we are asking this court to deal with the matter, the apex court to deal with the matter, and, and to, to, of course, allow our appeal. And Mr. Stefan, you must understand that since this court comprises members very familiar and derived from small societies, we have every appreciation of how difficult it would be, especially at an earlier stage for a director of public prosecutions to intervene. However, since there has been a new election, and disqualification of those who were elected in 2014 for any alleged offense committed then is no longer um, possible in relation to that term. Um, the question that I asked um, occurred to me. Thank you. Well, you're, 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 have, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the point that you've made about the parliament being dissolved in 1919 has in fact rendered the prosecution academic and mute. But we felt, my clients felt, 
in particular because you, if an election petition is filed and is not heard before the parliament is dissolved, the, part, the petition dies. And the whole idea of qualification or disqualification to sit in a particular parliament has become mute because that parliament has, 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 has been dissolved. All right. But rather than take the academic point, academic issue point, um, Justice, um, and your honors, we felt important to have these issues litigated by the Apex Court. And the Shilling Ford will tell you that even though it's a new parliament, a conviction at this stage has the disqualification running from the date of conviction. So it is not as um, simplistic or straightforward as that. Well, I would disagree with that, but that's not the argument before the court right now, Justice Barrow. Okay, um, I thank you for your submissions, um, Mr. Astefan. Um, I am minded that we should take a, a five minute break um, and then we we'll come back by at 11.26. So you need not come out, exit out of the program. You can just, um, if you wish, mm -hmm. turn off your microphone and your video. And at 11.26, we'll resume.
Okay, Ms. Schellingford, are you ready to present your arguments? Yes, Your Honor, I am. Your Honor, should I begin? Yes, please. Um, just a second. Um, yes, please do. Good morning, Your Honours. Uh, before I begin addressing the court, I would like to outline the manner in which the respondent submissions will be presented. I will first address the court on the background facts. Counsel Mr. Wayne Marsh will address on the constitutional law principles, which are dealt with in par at paragraphs 13 to 9. Yeah, just, just one second, Ms. Um, I'm Justice Jamadar, are you with us? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. proceed. So, Council, Mr. Marsh will address on the court on the constitutional principles, and then I will continue by applying these principles uh, of constitutional interpretation um, to the House of Assembly Elections Act and to the relevant constitutional provisions. Towards the end, I will address and report the specific arguments which were raised by the appellants in their oral submissions. But before I begin with the, the background facts, there was, a, there was a question which was posed by um, the Honorable Justice Wheat um, concerning whether there have been prosecutions on the, um, well, for corrupt practices. Uh, in the, before the Court of Appeal, um, we presented cases where there were prosecutions for corrupt pr practices. Um, these cases, unfortunately, were omitted from the submissions which we filed before the CCJ because of the page limit. We had to cut down everything to 10 pages. Um, so we, we decided to leave out those cases. Um, but they are referred to in the Record of Appeal at page 960, 960, that is our skeletal arguments before the Court of Appeal. And one of those cases, or uh, the, the case which was uh, referred to there is Re Halton and Re Cross. It's a Canadian decision found in the Canadian abridgment. Um, also, in the Canadian abridgment, um, there are several other cases where there have been successful prosecutions for corrupt practices. This include R versus Hogg, and uh, um, but there was also a prosecution in May versus Reed. Um, all right, so having answered that specific question, um, I will now look at the background facts. So this case concerns criminal complaints which were filed by the respondents in the magistrate court alleging that the appellants committed the criminal acts of treating contrary to section 56 of the House of Assembly Elections Act. Now after the after the respondents filed these complaints the learned magistrate issued summons compelling the uh, appellants to attend court into the complaint. Now, this is a normal procedure which happens in the magistrate courts every day. Ordinary persons, ordinary civilians um, have the, the, the or are likely or um, are at the risk of being summoned to the magistrate court to answer to complaints. It is part of the legal system. Um, this is how this is the law that applies to all citizens. Now the respondent, the appellant, sorry, um, then filed judicial review proceedings and um, argued that the decision of the magistrate to summon them to court was wrong. Um, the high court judge then agreed with the appellant and quashed the decision of the, the magistrate. Now, it is our submission, and this is something that the Court of Appeal agreed with, 
it is our submission that the learned magistrate was correct in issuing the summons. He acted lawfully and he discharged his duties under the Magistrate Code of Procedure Act. If we look at section 68 and 225 of the Magistrate Code of Procedure Act, then we will see that the treating is a summary offense and that summary offenses should be filed, complaints of summary offenses, sorry, should be filed within six months. But before we look at the Magistrate Code of Procedure Act, we should begin by looking at sections 56 and 59 of the House of Assembly Elections Act. This is contained at page 1097 of the record of appeal, of the court's record. So section 56, which is the which is central to this case, because this is the section under which the appellants were, were charged. And therefore, this is the section that they are, in a sense, challenging. 56 says, the following persons shall be deemed guilty of treating within the meaning of this act. A, every person who corruptly, by himself or by any other person, either before, during, or after an election, directly or indirectly gives or provides or pays wholly or in part the expenses of giving or providing any food, drink, entertainment, or, prov or provision to or for any person for the purpose of corruptly influencing that person or any other person to vote or refrain from voting at the election or on account of that person or any other person having voted or refrained from voting at the election. So I stress the word after um, to highlight that the offense can treat it, of treating can be committed even after an election, including possibly three weeks, a month after the election. So if it is that the appellant's um, submissions are, are considered, um, then this would mean that the word after would be rendered meaningless. It, it would provide immunity to um, elected politicians, or it would provide them with an, a, a loophole, a, an escape route, so that they could um, engage in treating after an election, 21 days after an election, and then um, based on the submissions of the appellant, um, they will be immune from, from prosecution, which um, could not that could not be the law. It no, I think what, the, I, if I understand the other side correctly, what they're saying is one, knowing that you are prosecuting these persons for an offense which can result in their being disqualified from parliament and therefore having a choice between proceeding under this provision and proceeding by way of election petition, you deliberately chose to proceed under this provision bypassing all of the restrictions, all of the, one might want to call them safeguards, but all of the, 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 the matrix of measures that are specifically geared for the disqualification of someone from parliament. That's the gist of what they're saying. Your Honor, two things. I, I would respond to that um, argument um, in two, two ways. One, the law provides that the respondents can file criminal complaints for of treating, and so they did, because it is provided for in the law. Uh, secondly, the restrictions or the safeguards which counsel is referring to do not, Your Honor, they are not, uh, 
they do not exist in the manner that council described them. For example, when we examine section 56, section 56 says that the offense can, of treating can be committed after an election. So our respectful argument is that if the offense is, if the acts, the criminal acts are done after an election, then this question of petition or we, we should have gone by petition would not arise. Uh, Your Honor, towards the, the end of my um, presentation, I, or perhaps I should do it right now. Um, Madam, would, so could you explain to me how you treat, who you, how you do that after the election, because it is for the purposes purpose of influencing uh, uh, to vote, the person to vote. But after the election, you already voted. So how is that done? Just for my education. OK, so Section 56 actually uses the word after. So it, yes. it is in this section. And it's not um, only to vote or to re refrain from voting, but it is on account of that person or any other person having voted or refrained from voting at an election. So um, hypothetically, I could give you a hypothetical in terms of how that section could apply. Um, possibly um, someone could have been promised, I will give you some entertainment if you vote for me. Um, the voter um, being influenced by that promise um, would not have exercised his franchise um, based on his conscience or real opinion, but would have been influenced based on that promise of material gain or entertainment, whatever it is, and would have voted at the election because of that promise, right? So mm -hmm. that is not, the, the voter is not in those circumstances acting freely. He's influenced by money or material or entertainment. And after the election, perhaps a month or two months after election, the promise is delivered. So these are the things that affect the integrity of the, our elections and affect good governance in the country. Mm -hmm. And I, I do not want to really delve into policy reasons, but there are reasons why bribery and treating and this kind of um, acts that result in whoever, have it, whoever has the most funding ends up winning the elections. There are reasons why these actions are criminal offenses. The main reason being that elections should not be won or purchased based on whoever has the most funding. So, so council um, referred to expediency and the need for certainty, etc. Um, I would like to, at this stage, highlight that expediency is not more important than electoral integrity, good governance, and principles of democracy. So if we look at Section 68 of the House of Assembly Elections Act, and that is at page 1101 of the record, this is what Section 68 says. And this is what the council um, representing the appellant is basing his argument concerning um, expediency, et cetera, on the, this um, magic number of 21. It says the following provisions shall apply with respect to the presentation of an election petition. The petition shall be presented within 21 days after the return made by the returning officer of the member to whose election the petition relates unless, and this is the most important part I wish to highlight, unless it concerns an allegation of corrupt practices upon the making of the return of election and specifically alleges a payment of money or a reward to have been made by any member or on his account or with his privity since the time of the return in pursuance or furtherance of the corrupt practices, in which case the petition may be presented at any time within 28 days after the date of payment. So. There's no magic no, magic um, concern with 21 days. It must be, everything must be settled within 21 days, full stop, full stop. That is what counsel for the appellant would um, like to have the court believe. Um, but the electoral laws provide that even after the passage of 21 days, election petitions can be filed if it is that 
these acts are done. So there's no certainty associated with with um with an electoral term. Um, electoral terms could be, as we saw in Guyana, it could be cut short by, um, for example, a no confidence vote. Um, so. So but I, your side chose to bypass the election petition process altogether. My Your Honor, uh, the, our response to that is that there is no mandatory obligation or there's no obligation under the electoral laws to file an election petition. Election petition, election petitions have um, certain rules associated with them and um, you know it is one option that is available to electors or voters etc that is an option but at this another option which is available is the option of filing criminal complaints it is well known and we this is trite law that we can all take judicial notice of that the same action can constitute both criminal and civil offenses if someone were to attack me today, I can file a criminal complaint against them or the police can do it on my behalf. If I'm not, if the, the police officer who's investigating the matter does not do it, I have the right to do it, to file a private criminal complaint, to get redress. I also have the right to file a civil claim to get compensation. So the, the very same action can constitute a criminal con could constitute the basis of a criminal case and a civil case. It is no different. What if in each case? In Sorry, go ahead, Justice Anderson. I was just, just a very quick question. Um, do you agree with uh, Mr. Astefan that the Director of Public Prosecutions can intervene and discontinue private prosecutions? Well, preliminarily, um, without having um, really focused on this question, um, since it, it has never been raised before, sure. I would have to say yes. I, yes. I would have to say yes, based okay. on my understanding of the Nolly process. I, I won't hold you to that. I don't want to, I want to get an off the cup opinion. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a brief question to Ms. Schillingford about uh, something that I believe I heard Mr. Astefan mention. He mentioned the word chaos which is a st fairly strong word <laughs> to say to a court, um, if, if these two streams would, would not be allowed to continue, as far as I understand the criminal um, context in which your clients have brought charges for treating. And then there is, of course, what that which was available for an election offense, which is on by way of election petition, I, I heard, um, I believe it is my brother, Justice Anderson, who raised the issue of uh, uh, of reform. Uh, what do you, what do you want? To, what do you say to that? Is, is this the ideal for the people of Dominica and for the certainty of governance in Dominica? Your Honor, I would have to say yes, it is because I don't know. Um, I don't know if the court can take judicial notice of certain things which happen in Dominica, um, but I believe that it is very important um, to recognize and, and to maintain that elected politicians are not above the law. They are not entitled to any better treatment from the court, from the court, from a, an independent judiciary as compared to opposition members, non-elected politicians. Um, now, counsel used the word disruptive effect in addition to the word um, chaos. Firstly, I would I would say that the if if it is that counsel describes the um, criminal prosecutions as having as having disruptive effects, then what then? How then would counsel describe the election petitions? Because these are both court proceedings, which are which would pend or which would continue after an election. So um, the, the 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 existence of court proceedings cannot be regarded as as having disruptive effect. Um, but further, um, if counsel is refer, uh, referring to um, the 
there being some disruptive effect when members of parliament have to line up the court before, outside of the court. Cons the courts should have judicial notice of the fact that very often in the Commonwealth of Dominica, members of parliament on the opposition side have to line up outside of the magistrate court because they are very frequently charged with criminal offenses such as incitement. And there are several pending cases, including a case against the leader of the opposition um, for incitement based on words that he would have said on political platforms. So I do not believe that one set of laws or the, the members who persons who do not support the government should be treated in one way by the court or by the law, and then elected politicians should be given preferential treatment. That cannot be the rule of law. It is discriminatory. The rule of law requires that everyone be treated equally. So that is my response to this. Um, concerning electoral reform, um, Your Honor, um, electoral reform is something that I would I would welcome. Um, and it's something that um, citizens of Dominica have been asking for for several years. Um, so I would not, um, I, I hope that that answers your uh, your questions, my lady. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shenanford. Thank you. Now, um, so I have looked at section 56, which defines treating. And I would like to highlight as well section 59 of the House of Assembly Elections Act which is also on page 1097. And it says every person, not the word every person, not just um, non-politicians, non every person who is guilty of bribery, treating, or undue influence under the provisions of this act is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $5,000 or to imprisonment for six months. So. I would like to highlight that the, the use of the word summary conviction means that it must be um, based on a trial before the magistrate court. And that point, though, is not in dispute since it has been, uh, well, it was accepted by the High Court and the Court of Appeal. And I believe counsel um, would have conceded to, to, to the definition of summary. Um, now, when we look at section 62, 62, sorry, um, section 61, that is the other relevant section in the House of Assembly Elections Act. It says every person who is convicted of bribery, treating, or onto influence, or personation, or aiding, counseling or procuring the commission of the offense of personation shall be incapable during a period of seven years from the date of the conviction, and then if we jump to B, of being elected a member of the House of Assembly, or if elected before his conviction of retaining his seat as such member. So it is clear that the House of Assembly Elections Act provide clearly that even sitting members of parliament are liable to being convicted of treating and to and may have to vacate their seat eventually um, if it is that they are convicted. When, where, when is that uh, act passed? Um, so, sorry, just let me ask this question, Justice Anderson. When was this act first passed? So the act was first passed in 19... 51, which is a very important um, point, Your Honor, um, Mr. President. That is a, a point which we are relying on, the timeline. And that is a point which I can, should I develop it now or should I address it later on in my submissions? Well, let me hear Justice Anderson first. Well, the, the, the question I was raising relates exactly to what you just said, Ms. Schillingford, because that seems as well to, what, to be what Mr. Astafun is arguing about. He's saying that if you go the route of the magistrate's court, there is a conviction. That conviction questions necessarily the legitimacy of the member to sit in parliament. Uh, he's saying further that the question of the legitimacy of a member to sit in parliament is the exclusive preserve of the high court. So how, how do you respond based on what you have just 
said to the argument that he's raising. Yes, my Lord, Mr. Asifan's, um, Council Mr. Asifan's, his arguments are based on section 40 of the constitution. So if we look at section 40 of the constitution and we consider the cross references, we can either read back or we can read forward. Um, since since the, the focus is on section 40, perhaps we should read back from section 40. Now, section 40 is at page 1297 of the record. And this is this is um, the section that Mr. Asavans, his well, the entire judicial review was was um, focused on. And what um, the trial judge relied on um, section 40 says this. The High Court shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine any question whether a any person has been validly elected as a representative or senator. 1A. Yes. Now, that section is not at all engaged, um, but that is something I would like to focus on um, later. Um, if we look at section 41D, on the same section 40, just subsection D, it reads, the, the High Court shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine any question whether any member of the House has vacated his seat or is required under the provision of Section 35.4 of this Constitution to cease to perform any of his functions as a member of the House. Now, Section 35.4 is cross-referenced, so we have to look at Section 35.4. We turn section 35.4. Section 35.4 says this. If, and that is at page 1293, if any circumstances such as are referred to in paragraph C of subsection 3 of this section arises. Now, just one point, we would have to then turn to paragraph Three, subsection C, before continuing with subsection 35.4. And this is what it says. A member shall also vacate his seat in the House, subject to the provisions of subsection 4 of this section, if any other circumstances arise, that if he were not a member, would cause him to be disqualified, to be elected or appointed as such, by virtue of subsection 1 of section 32 of this constitution or by virtue of any law enacted to subsection 2 or 3 or 5 of that section. Now this section is essentially saying that um, if a person is convicted of, a cor of corrupt practice, which is provided for in section 32.5, which I think um, the, the, the court had referred the counsel um, to 32.5. And so if it is that a person is convicted of a corrupt practice, found guilty of a corrupt practice, then that person must vacate his seat. That is provided for in section 35.3 of the Constitution, because 35.3 refers to section 32 of the Constitution. And section 32, which I think the court had, had looked at already, section 32.3 says, if it is so provided by parliament, a person who is convicted by any court of law of any offense that is prescribed by parliament and that is connected with the election of members or who is reported guilty of such offenses by the court trying an election petition shall not be qualified for a period not exceeding seven years following his conviction, or as the case may be, following the report of the court as may be so prescribed to be elected or appointed a member. So the, the use of the disjunctive or shows that there are two possibilities. You can be convicted by any court, not, a, not just an electoral court, any court, which includes the magistrate court, of an election election offense. And if you are convicted, then you are not qualified. If we jump to section 35.3, which cross-references the very same 
section 32.3, it says that if you are so convicted, then you must, you must vacate. You must vacate. Um, section 35.4 um, provides the option, or this is a safeguard, essentially. Um, so it, it provides the option of appealing, and it says this. So this is a safeguard which applies. Um, if any circumstances such as are referred to in paragraph C, paragraph subsection 3 of the section arise, because a member is under the sentence of death or imprisonment, a judge to be of unsound mind, declared bankrupt or convicted or reported guilty or reported guilty of an offense relating to the election, and if it is open to the member to appeal against the decision, either with the level of a court of law or other authority or with, sorry, with the leave of a court of law or other authority or without such leave, he shall forthwith cease to perform his function as a member, but subject to the proviso of this subsection, of this section, he shall not vacate his seat until the expiration of a period of 30 days thereafter. And this is the proviso. Provided that the speaker may... We, we got it, we got it. We, 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 we could read it ourselves, the shape. So that what you... So, okay. The, I understand you to be saying that if a prospective member of the House, a person who is going up for elections in the middle of an election campaign, is perceived to have committed an election offense such as treating, that a person who is aggrieved has the option either of filing an election petition or of bringing a private prosecution under the magistrate's jurisdictions, um, under the summary jurisdictions um, procedure. Is, is that correct? Yes, my lord. Yes, my lord. And, I, and I, the I fact that, I'm not quite finished. The fact that quite apart from the criminal penalties that exist if the magistrate were to find that person guilty, the fact that there are consequences that overlap with the consequences which would have attended the filing of, elect of an election petition is of no moment as far as you are concerned. It is, it is irrelevant. Your Honor, I'm going further to say that this consequence is provided for in the Constitution and that something cannot be unconstitutional if it is that the Constitution provides for it. This is the same argument that basically the death penalty cases they, they were faced with because the, the Constitution itself recognized the, um, the, the possibility of having the death penalty. And therefore, even the, the Privy Council boys you know, could not declare something unconstitutional if it is provided for in the very same Constitution. We must, we must respect the wording of the Constitution. And um, this was also in the Joseph and Boyce case by the CCJ, um, the, the importance of respecting the wording of the Constitution, um, you know, that was, that was um, referred to. So, so, so yes, that is our, our right. essential so argument. So it, it, it doesn't perturb you, it doesn't bother you, you, you're not concerned with the fact that a complainant in the example that we gave is allowed to cherry pick their forum. Um, if their main purpose is to have the person disqualified, they in effect will be selecting the forum, the court, which they want to use to effect that purpose. That That is not, even though other parts of the constitution appear to lay down a particular uh, set of procedures and a particular court for disqualification of a person from the House of Assembly. Um, it, 
doesn't perturb you that the aggrieved party is able to bypass that and to effect his or her purpose by prosecuting him at the magistrate's court. In your view, the Constitution allows for that overlap to the extent that one considers it an overlap. Is that your argument? Yes, my Your Honor. Your Honor, I do not see, I'm not at all disturbed by it um, because that is that has always been the law. Um, persons have different avenues which are available to them. Um, if we, that is the law in Dominica. Um, so having in different jurisdictions, it might be different. Um, but if we look at, for example, the table of content of the House of Assembly Elections Act, um, we see that electoral offenses on page 1064, 1064 of the CCJ record, we see electoral offenses are dealt with in part five of the act, Elec elections petition are dealt with in part six. So these are two completely different creatures and they, they must be dealt with differently. The law provides for it. Um, there are many sections of law which perhaps are not regularly utilized by citizens. Um, you know, perhaps we are not um, as litigious a society as other societies, but the law is the law. And this is provided for in the law. It is an option that is available and it was utilized. Um, and therefore, um, it is the function of the judiciary to simply hear, hear the case and interpret and apply the law as it exists. Um, the judiciary cannot change the law. That is the, the function of, of parliament. Council, may I ask this question? Um, if an election petition were to be brought or had been brought, could there be one election petition against all 11 or whatever members? My Lord, Your Honor, um, my my view on this is no. My view, my view on this, having read um, certain election petition cases, is that an election petition must be against each return. So um, different election petitions must be cha filed challenging each return, and that the, the the practice is for the petitions to be consolidated. Um, but my understanding of the law in this area um, is that different petitions should, should be filed. Follow up, follow up question, Council. Would it therefore be a cheaper thing to bring a petition, sorry, a prosecution against 11 persons rather than to bring an election petition against 11 or however many persons? Would it be? Bring more? 11 election petitions. Yes. 11. Well, Jan. Your Honor, um, as it relates to um, cheaper, I, I, I am not privy to how the state's um, spends in terms of defending. Oh, no, 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 you're not following me. The persons who are complaining of treating, mm -hmm. I am thinking that it must be cheaper for them to bring a complaint in a magistrate's court rather than for them to bring 11 election petitions. I don't remember that. Anyway, well, yeah. Yes, I would think I would think that um, the magistrate court is much more accessible um, to members of the public than um, the electoral court in an election petition. I, I would think so, because um, regularly persons file um, private criminal prosecutions. It's something that happens every day in Dominica. You, you would therefore say that it does not represent necessarily any abuse of process to go by way of criminal complaint as opposed to going by way of election petitions. No, my lord. no my lord. I, I do not see any, any um, abuse of the court process um, being applicable because um, Electoral offenses and the, the and filing private criminal prosecutions. These are things which are actually provided for um, by the by the law, and so it's a utilization of the court process. It's part of the access to justice. It's part of um, the right to protection of the law. Someone must always be able to access the courts. I I, I think you have made your point. Thank you. Mr. Limpet, may I ask you a question? Um, in terms of an election petition. 
this is a sort of a hypothetical question, I imagine. If there is a finding of, uh, say, treating, does that necessarily mean that the petition is successful? Or is the test on an election petition ultimately whether or not the uh, complaint would have a material impact on the outcome of an election. So, for example, uh, you can have an election petition in which you can establish that there was interference with voting, but the evidence discloses that, for example, that interference or those whatever practices, corrupt practices, impacted, let's say, 50 votes. But the difference between the winner and the loser was, say, 500 or 1,000 or 5,000. Is it a fortiori that if you succeed in demonstrating uh, an illegality or corrupt uh, practice or uh, that the petition will succeed, especially if the if the evidence does not show that the outcome would be affected. I ask that question because, of course, a criminal proceeding has no business with that. A criminal proceeding is have you or have you not committed a criminal offense in personam, as it were. An election petition is concerned with a very different question. It is concerned with the outcome of an election. And that when, when we talk about expediency and certainty and so, uh, election petitions, and I have sat on a few of them in Trinidad, uh, the question that you ask is directed to outcome. And that is where expediency comes in, because if it is that the evidence you bring forward may be very good evidence, may demonstrate all of these things, but may not change the outcome. Mm -hmm. It may be that the petition may be dismissed. Now, I don't know, based on section, um, I think it is in the Constitution, it appears to be suggested, okay. however, okay. that if there is a conviction against an elected member or an unelected member in terms of future disqualification, there are consequences. So I'm just trying to work out in my own mind whether or not it's as simple as any summary charge that can be uh, uh, offense, a corrupt offense, necessarily can form the basis of an election petition. Yes, my lord, you are absolutely, yes, your honor, you are absolutely right. Um, my understanding of this, you know, this is my understanding of election petitions, is that the court, the court has to determine whether the action affected the elections, the outcome of the elections. So it is not every it's not every act that can form properly form the basis of an election petition. Because if, let's say, one person was bribed, and um, for example, um, the the elected person might have won by a hundred votes, um, then my understanding, at least, as to what is the current learning on this, um, the the court may not set aside the elections because it's just one individual. So it's not every electoral offense that would that would form a proper basis of having filing an election petition. So that is one of the reasons why it is important to have two separate and distinct things. Um, election petitions concern, um, you know, whether whether what is the validity of the return? What is the validity of the return? But electoral offenses deal with the individual. It examines the individual and whether that is a fit and proper person to hold public office. I think the, the, the reasoning behind it is that we should not have persons who are engaged in bribery and treating and corruption um, in public office, in government. Um, similarly, um, there are provisions concerning bankruptcy and um, someone being held in, well, found insane, um, insanity. 
So we should not have bankrupts and insane persons holding public office. That That is the logic behind it. So if that is correct, and I hope Mr. Asifan will address it when he gets an opportunity to reply, but if that is correct, then a successful election petition, I'm speaking quantitatively, because this is a quantitative versus qualitative distinction. A successful election petition must quantitatively raise sufficient instances of, let us say, corrupt practice or treating, let's face, face what we're dealing with here, treating to have had an impact or a, I think the standard, if I, if I recall the learning, is a, a likely, I think it is a standard of likelihood, a likely objective, an objectively likely outcome, impact on the outcome of the election. Yes. Well, so that even, even though the, the quality standard of evidence differs for the nature of the allegation, for the purposes of a petition, whether or not the outcome would be affected, the standard, is it not a reasonably li a reasonable likelihood or is it a higher standard in terms of the outcome of the election? So there are two different things going on here. There's a standard for the con allegation, the, the, the conduct that it is alleged happened, and then there is a standard for the determination of the core question, which is the validity of the election. So I so just to, I've used a lot of words and time there. What I'm trying to ask is, even if there is an allegation of treating corrupt practice, is it that that must also cross the threshold where it was so such it was such that it would have likely affected the outcome on an objective standard? Yes. My lord, that is an uh, that is a, a very well, it's an excellent angle for uh, looking at it. Um, but I must admit that this question was never posed in the high court or the courts of appeal, and so it was not addressed in our submissions. Um, but the concerning the standard of proof, which I know is different from what you are referring to, um, we did in fact deal with the standard of proof, and this is at page nine five nine of the record uh, where we look at the case of Jogna. Um, now, concerning the, um, the difference between the election petition and the electoral offenses, um, we would agree that these are very different um, creatures. And we would, we would posit that the electoral offense has the, as the standard of proof um, beyond reasonable doubt, whereas the election petition um, it's a civil, civil. Um, it's a civil case which must be addressed or looked at with on a balance of, of probability. The case that we refer to is Jognaf and Rinaldo, and as I said, it's referred to as at page nine five nine of the record. Um, that was in our skeletal arguments before the court of appeal. Now, if I understand you correctly, then you're saying it's cheaper to go to the magistrate's court than go to the election petition uh, to the high court for an elect with an election petition uh, although the, st the, 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 the the standard of proof in the magistrate magistrate court is somewhat higher um, on the other hand in the election in the in the high court with a petition you need to prove more not only that there is treating, but that that had an effect on the outcome of the election. You don't have to prove that before the magistrate. And then thirdly, uh, the outcome of a positive finding of treating in the magistrate's court well leads to a fine, but also uh, to a disqualification of seven years that you cannot vote and you cannot be elected. And if you're already elected, that you have to go. And for the coming seven years after the conviction, you won't be able to participate in, in any election. While I think the outcome of an election petition, if you can prove treating, if you can prove that it had 
uh, uh, sufficient effect on the outcome. That will lead only for you to vacate your seat, but it would not prohibit you from allowing to participate in the next election, um, which might be in two years or three years, and be elected again. Is that is that a correct um, approach? My lord, um, no. If I if I if I may, um, my lord, the word cheaper. Um, it is not our position that one one. Um, I thought that you said that uh, it's uh, uh, in case of an election petition, you need 11 in this case. And in case of magistrate's court, you only Sorry, need that was one. my mistake. It's, it's 15. 15. OK, well, even worse. No, my Lord. No, no, no. My Lord, um, I would not use the word cheaper because my understanding of the word cheaper um, is that it, it refers to the cost. Yes. I do not know. I do not know whether the parties um, may choose to be represented by council or senior council or queen's council, etc. So I do not know what the cost, because in in private criminal proceedings, the complainants can be represented by council. Um, or additionally, the defendant can be represented by council. Um, so in terms of cost, um, I am not in a position, and I don't think it is possible. Um, for anyone um, to make a comparative analysis of the two provisions based on cost. Um, what our submission is and what it has always been is that these are two very different creatures, which two very different options, which are provided for by law. And whether you compare the two and, and um, get advantages or disadvantages of the two, the fact remains that it was open to the respondents under the laws of Dominica to file complaints of, tra of treating before the magistrate court. I, I think I understand you to be saying that the, the, the possible outcome of prosecuting a charge of treating in the magistrate's court is different and even much harsher than if the same charge is prosecuted against an MP by way of an election petition, that they are very different. They are very different. They are very different. Electoral offenses are extremely different from election petitions. The consequences are different. The standard of proof different. Um, as um, his lordship, um, Justice Jamada, um, pointed out, in election petitions, you have to consider as to whether there was an impact on the outcome of the elections. They are extremely different and two different, two different creatures, which are both provided for in the laws of Dominica. In, in the course of an election petition. Sorry, sorry. go ahead, Justice Witt. No, no, I agree with that. One is criminal, one is constitutional. Uh, um, all the differences are there, but there is an overlap. Both lead to, um, to the fact that uh, if you're an elected member, you have to vacate your seat. Um, and in the case of the petition, uh, maybe in a shorter, short for a shorter period than uh, in case of, an, of, of a conviction. So there is some overlap. We can't deny that. Well, with the electoral offense, you don't automatically have to vacate your seats. There must be a process engaged on the section 41D sure. of the constitution. So this is similar to what happened in the Denzel Douglas case, where by originating motion, uh, the attorney general um, filed a, a, a claim um, based on um, Dr. Douglas having been become disqualified. And so his, well, he had to vacate his seat. So there's, a, there's an entirely separate procedure that has to be followed after the conviction and it, it has to be followed in the high court. So in that sense, the high court retains um, jurisdiction. The high court has the final say. Now, having dealt with these background um, facts, um, I would now um, invite Council Mr. Marsh to address the court on the relevant constitutional law principles.
Mr. Marsh? Mr. Marsh? Can you hear? Can I be heard now? Yes, we're hearing you now. I think my mic was on mute, so I apologize for that. Yes. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and I'm, ple I'm, this is pre I'm pleased to be here before the court this afternoon. I think it's afternoon in the Caribbean, correct? That is correct. Good. Um, Your Honors, this appeal before the court raises several issues of settled constitutional law principle that the appellants are asking this court to disturb. It's a respondent submission that such invitation should be re resisted by this court. Central to this case are the principles of um, separation of powers and the doctrine of the rule of law. It would seem that the appellants are asking this court to treat them as above and beyond the confines of the law of the Commonwealth of Dominica. The principle of separation of power and the rule of law has been consistently held by the Caribbean courts to include all persons of all, of no matter the rank, of all ranks. And so, you know, the Privy Council in Sharma versus Antoine, where Lord Bingham stated as follows, and I want to read from the submissions of the respondents, where Lord Bingham said in paragraph 16 of the submissions, the rule of law requires that subject to any immunity, or exemption provided by law, the criminal law of the land should apply to all alike. A person is not to be singled out. Sorry, a person is not to be singled out for adverse treatment because he holds a high and dignified office of state, but nor can the holding of such an office excuse conduct which would lead to the prosecution the prosecution of one not holding such an office. The maintenance of public confidence in the administration of justice requires it to be, and seem to be, even handed. Similarly, similar, your honors, similarly, your honors, in Gary versus the Attorney General, the Chief Justice Byron, as he then was, stated, litigation- Mr. Marsh, yes, uh, we, we read all those uh, citations, so. You right. don't have to go through that in extenso. I think Thank you. this court also said that nobody is above the law. So I think we could agree on that very quickly. Thank you, Your Honours. I would like to go on, Your Honours, to highlight the matter of R versus Hughes, where the court held that, and this is Justice Byron again, making the point very eloquently that it is the duty of the court, the judiciary, to engage in application of the law and applying, engage in, in applying the law and not in, in putting its own values as to what the law should be. So clearly there is a separation between the function of the court and that of parliament. Parliament in the, in the, in the, in the, present, in the case before the court has clearly stated in the constitution that subject if you look at section 32.4, that any court, any court shall have jurisdiction to determine whether or not the, the, the applicants in this case, the, the appellants in this case, can be subject to the magistrate court's jurisdiction. If the constitution provides as it has, as it does in Dominica for the principles of separation of power, and the rule of law. It is our submission that the appellant in this case is no different from any other person in the Commonwealth of Dominica and must, like all citizens in Dominica, suffer the same fate. Your Honor, the appellant in the case has failed to- You, you would accept, Mr. Marsh, that the he could intervene and discontinue the private prosecutions, would you not? 
Yes, Your Honor, but that does not negate uh, that the Constitution is clear. The DPP has that power, but until the DPP does so, the appellants are in no better position than any ordinary citizen of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Okay. Your Honor, I think my submissions are very short. It is that no one is above the law, and the court has you, jurisdiction. You would, also, you would also admit, Mr. Marsh, sorry to interrupt you, uh, just to get my question in, um, that whilst the members are in the House, they do enjoy uh, certain immunities as well, um, which the, I don't like to use the word, ordinary um, citizens um, do not. But would you also agree to that? Yes, I would agree to the extent that they, they, they enjoy certain immunities. However, like any criminal, any persons charged with a criminal offense, they do not enjoy such immunities. If it was that, the, if it is that the parliament wanted to create such immunity, they would have, the parliament would have done so in very clear terms. And so, Your Honours, the words yeah, of the country... Just, just to stretch that point, if Parliament were to attempt to do that, um, would it pass constitutional muster based on what you, you said earlier about everybody being well, equal before the law? Well, the Parliament would have had to satisfy the requirements of the Constitution, which is the, the special majorities that the Constitution sets out by way of referendum, etc. But it is not for the, for the Parliament to make laws that are inconsistent with the Constitution. But until the Parliament have acted, perhaps by way of um, legislative reform, then the laws must be applied to each and every person, regardless of their rank. I understand you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honours. With that said, unless there are any further questions, I'd um, turn the submissions back over to Mr. Lingford. Um, Mr. I don't know if you're going to address this or Ms. Schillenford, but we had, we, we had asked, I believe, a question or prompted uh, at the beginning of an inquiry on the timelines, because Mr. Astafan's argument is in part premised on the modification clause. That is to say, pre-1978 legislation, certainly pre the first constitution, uh, that legislation must be read in conformity with in particular section 40, the policy be behind section 40, I think that's his argument. And so the policy behind section 40 is anything that can touch or concern the invalidity of an ele election must come by election petition. I think I will not dealing with the service. I think that's a short handle for what he is saying. And therefore all other laws that are somehow not aligned with that policy, that section 40 policy, constitutional policy, must be read uh, or modified to bring them in alignment with that. Therefore, the earlier the uh, House of Assembly, um, what is it now, House of Assembly elections law, etc., etc., have to be read uh, in that context. And you, I believe, Mr. Levert, started to respond, and then I think you deferred to, I believe, um, Mr. Marsh, I'm not sure, but you were going to tell us something that you said was very important. So I am. I would like to hear what is, what is this important submission. Thank you, Your Honor. So, yes, I, I would agree that, um, or I believe that the timeline is extremely important. And the arguments concerning the timeline are dealt with at paragraphs eight and nine of our submissions. So when we look at the legislative timeline, we see that, um, well, we first have to recognize that there are two, there are three pieces of legislative view. One, the Magistrate Court of Procedure Act, which clearly defines what is a summary proceeding. And that was enacted on the 10th of February, 1892. So since 1892, the, it was clear, the law was clear as to what constitutes summary conviction, summary proceeding, summary court, etc. 
The second piece of legislation is the House of Assembly Elections Act, which was passed on the 16th of July, 1951. And that is the legislation that contains Section 56 and Section 59. And so when Parliament started in 1951, um, it is clear that when they use the word summary, um, they knew the meaning of that word. That word was well defined. Then comes the Constitution of 1967, which Council for the Appellants um, frequently referred to, but I would prefer to focus on the 1978 Constitution since it is a relevant um, Constitution. But in any event, both the 1967 and 1978 Constitutions are post-1951. 1951 being the year in which the House of Assembly Elections Act was passed. Now, when we examine both the 1967 and 1978 constitution, we see that they are perfectly consistent and in sync with the House of Assembly Elections Act. Both refer to seven years disqualification. Um, so when Parliament, or when the makers of our constitution, whoever the makers were, um, decided to word or phrase the constitution in 1978, then this was done with the House of Assembly Elections Act in, in mind. Um, so I would say our, our argument is that the these three pieces of legislation are, are perfectly consistent with each other and perfectly consistent with the Constitution, the 1967 and 1978 Constitution. Further, Council referred to the modification clause um, which is provided for in Section 2 of the Constitution Order. The Constitution Order was filed um, and is contained at page 2, 2370. 2, of the of the um of the the record now the there is a schedule um section two which speaks about modif modifying existing laws to bring them into conformity of the constitution so i'm reading specifically from page 2372 and this is what section two says the existing law shall as from the commencement of the constitution be construed with such modifications adaptation, qualifications, and exceptions as may be necessary to bring them into conformity with the Constitution and Supreme Court order. Now, the word conformity is important because this, this section only applies when the laws are inconsistent with the Constitution. But in a situation where the laws perfectly conform with the constitution or are perfectly consistent with the constitution there is not the modification clause cannot be utilized because there's nothing to to modify um so it is our submission that um th this invitation to use the modification clause um to modify the law um you know that that is an invitation into error um what, 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 the, the, the invitation is to modify it for it to say what um, my, my well, I suppose that's a question that is better asked of Mr. Astafan, but if you could help me then. Yes, yes. The, the invitation is to modify to say that um, sitting members of parliament or ele elected uh, members of parliament are immune from criminal prosecutions for electoral offenses. That is but then the, that would conflict with the constitution itself, wouldn't it? it it Where the Constitution speaks about if a person is convicted of an election offense. Yes, my lord. Yes, my lord. You, you, you can't get a conviction in an election petition, can you? No, you can't get a conviction in the election petition. No. And yeah. and um, the, the Constitution also makes reference to appealing to um to even the uh, a court above the court of appeal, which cannot be done in an election petition. Um so the, the constitution the constitution is perfectly consistent or provides for electoral offenses. Um, therefore, seeing that the House of Assembly Elections Act is perfectly consistent with the constitution, um, there is nothing to modify. Can, can you assist me? And uh, because it wasn't quite clear that the high, 
Well, apparently the High Court judge modified something. But um, I think Justice Burgess also tried to find out from Mr. Astafan. I suppose a modification means that you read some part of the law differently, that you take out something or that you put in something so that it conforms. But up to now, I'm not clear what exactly was read differently or read down or um, uh, maybe you can assist. Yes, my lord. My lord, um, this is on page 342 of the record. Yes. And this is the High Court judge's decision. Um, the, her ladyship stated, um, therefore, in the case at bar, where the House of Assembly Elections Act makes reference to summary conviction for the offense of treating, which would mean the complaint is to be heard by the magistrate, this is in conflict with Section 41 of the Constitution, uh, which provides that any question regarding the election of candidate to the House of Assembly must be dealt with, and this must be done by way of election petition, uh, which are subject to very strict rules of procedure, including and not restricted to the requirement that must be brought within 21 days. Um, so. There's a specific section on modification. But I'm more interested in what exactly did she modify and how? Um, my Lord. Because uh, that, that did not become clear to me. I believe, Michelle, in fact, that um, uh, Justice of Appeal Blenman um, also indicated that uh, she agreed, according to what I read at page 67 of the record, this is 6792, Justice of Appeal Blenman, I believe it is her judgment, says the learned judge quite properly modified or read down section 59 of the Elections Act a pre-independence legislation passed in 1951 so as to ensure that it did not infringe Section 41A of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is my understanding. I, I don't know if my brother, um, Justice Witt, uh, saw anything more, but that is what um, Justice yeah, that, Blenman agreed with, with the learned trial judge. Mm. Yeah, that's what I read, that you uh, read down uh, section 59, but I I couldn't find out how she read it down or how she modified 59. Yes, yes, my lord. I, I too have difficulty understanding um, how section 59 was modified. Um, I also, um, at, I think at some point in the judgment, um, reference was made to reading, reading down the Magistrate Court of Procedure Act as well, um, which I, I, I must admit, I, I did not quite follow how these um, sections could be modified, um, especially because there was no inconsistency with the Constitution. I, I do believe as well, Ms. Schillen, further the trial judge prior to that at page 66 of 92, she says that um, since she saw this conflict, sorry, this is Justice of Will Bedman, since she saw this conflict with uh, Section 41A and Sections um, 59 and together with 61, she says the court has a duty to modify it so as to bring it into conformity with Section 41A. Consequently, where Section 59 grants jurisdiction to the magistrate, insofar as it concerns elected members, it cannot coexist peacefully with the Constitution. So I assume that she is then saying that as far as an elected member is concerned, the law has to be modified, stroke or read down, so that it does not apply to an elected member. That is how I saw the argument, at least in the Court of Appeal, Ms. Sassaf, and might be able to assist us a little more when he comes back to respond, yeah. Yeah. yes. So 59 should read then every person except a, an elected member of the House who is guilty of bribery, treating and all of that is liable on summary conviction. 
but yes. I haven't seen that. Uh, I haven't seen that. I haven't read that. That would sound very um, awkward to me. But anyway. Yes, hello. Um, so, so I would um, much prefer the the decision of the majority. Um, that is Justice of Appeal Webster and Justice of Appeal Mitchell. And um, as indicated in the submissions, we are relying on the submission, the judgments of the majority in the Court of Appeal um, in its entirety. Now, I know that um, time may be um, limited, but I would just like to point out that um, at paragraph 12 of our um, submissions, we highlighted um, part of the majority judgment as um, summarized in the head notes. And um, just to raise what was what was said, um, it says there are several types of proceedings, the outcome of which can lead to a member of the House of Assembly being disqualified from retaining his seat and which are not proceedings to invalidate the election of a member of the House. These include bankruptcy proceedings, proceedings to determine a person's citizenship status or to determine the state of his mental health. It could not be that all such proceedings, once involving a member of the House of Assembly, must instituted by, be instituted by election petition within 21 days of the election of the member, as required by Section 68 of the Act, especially having regard to the fact that conduct leading to these proceedings may have occurred more than 21 day, uh, days after the, the election of the member. And then um, it, it, it is there. If there is a challenge to the validity of a member's election, the challenge must be pursued by election petition under Section 65 of the Elections Act. There is no requirement that a claim under Section 40 must be brought by election petition, except in relation to the challenge of the validity of the member under Section 41 of the Constitution. Such a challenge does not come into play in this case. Um, if the respondents are convicted, Section 41D may operate to cause the member to vacate his seat. This stage has not been reached in this case. In the circumstances, Section 59 of the Elections Act is not inconsistent with Section 40 or any other provision of the Constitution, and an elected member of the House of Assembly can be prosecuted by a magistrate for the offence of treating. Um, Your Honours, I think the, the majority decision is extremely well-reasoned, and um, as I indicated, we would um, rely on it in its entirety. Um, now, what paragraph is that? Sorry. Now, I was reading from the head notes of uh, the okay. of Fair the enough. decision. OK, no, that's OK. Fine. Thank you. But uh, Ms. Schillingford, uh, um, let's go through this because I, I'm trying to understand how this would work. Uh, there is an elected member and he is now convicted of treating. Um, he gets a fine. And 61 of the House of Assembly election Act says uh, every person who is convicted of that, of treating, shall, in addition to any other punishment, so the fine, be incapable during a period of seven years from the date of conviction, uh, if elected before his conviction, of retaining a seat as such member. So that is kind of an automatic uh, mandatory punishment because it speaks about punishment. So um, he, he is now convicted. And what is going to happen now? Because 61 is clear, you are incapable of uh, retaining your seat for seven years. So what do you do now? What happens now? Okay. Just, so, just try to go through that. So what happens is exactly what happened in the Denzel Daughters case. OK. And that decision is at page 1962 of the CCJ record. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at, for example, the, the facts in the head notes, um, it says the respondent, Dr. Douglas, is a citizen of St. Christopher Nevis, a leader of the opposition and a member of parliament. So he's a member of parliament. Having been elected to the National Assembly or the Assembly, at the invitation of the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica, Dr. Douglas applied for a Dominican diplomatic passport. He completed a passport application form with the exception of two columns of the form, which required him to represent himself as a Dominican citizen, which he was not. The diplomatic passport was 
issued to Doc Dr. Douglas by the Commonwealth of Dominica. And the bio data page of the passport states that he is a citizen of Dominica. The passport also contains an endorsement requesting that he be accorded protections of a citizen of Dominica. Dr. Douglas has used the passport to travel and gain entry to several countries for the convenience of travel and business purposes. The appellant, the Attorney General, became aware that Dr of Dr. Douglas's diplomatic passport given by Dominica and filed an originating motion in the High Court on the footing of Section 28.1a and Section 23, 21.3c of the Constitution of St. Christopher and Nevis, seeking inter alia a declaration that doc, Dr. Douglas, by reason of becoming a person who by virtue of his own act is on the acknowledgement of allegiance obedience or adherence to the Commonwealth of Dominica is automatically disqualified from sitting as a member of the assembly and is required to vacate his seat. The originating motion was heard and determined by a judge of the High Court. The learned judge determined that Dr. Douglas was not under an acknowledgement of allegiance in accordance with Dominican law and refused the relief sought in the motion with no order as to cost. The Attorney General appealed. The main issue for the court's determination is whether Dr. Douglas, by his application for receipt and use of a Dominican diplomatic passport, is under an acknowledgement of allegiance, obedience, or adherence to a foreign power or state in the terms of Section 28.1a of the Constitution, and is therefore required to vacate his seat in the National Assembly in accordance with Section 31.3c of the Constitution. Held, allowing the appeal declaring that Dr. Douglas is required to vacate his seat in the assembly and ordering each party to bear their own cost. Now, if we look Yeah, at go back to this case now. So okay. the, member of, the member of parliament has been convicted of treating and 61 says automatically are now incapable during seven years um, to, to be elected and as you are already elected, to retain your seat. It's very clear. Uh, so what happens then? What happens then is that if the person is convicted and after this, this individual um, has exhausted his appeal, if he decides to appeal or she decides to appeal, um, then an originating motion can be filed before the High Court seeking a declaration that the person has vacated their seat. And um, Council, let me interrupt you. No. Is there anything which requires an application to the High Court? Is it not within the competence mm -hmm. of the speaker to determine the question? Well, that the is speaker, absolutely. That is speaker absolutely. May. Go ahead. Sorry, my lord. I, I'm, sorry, I'm saying the speaker may require the matter to be determined by the High Court. But it seems to me that the speaker can also, if the speaker decides that the matter is sufficiently clear, the speaker may also make the determination that you have vacated your seat and you shall not come back in here. Is my that Lord, correct? My Lord, I am guided and that is absolutely correct. No, 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 no. I, I, no, I am not telling you how it goes. I'm asking if that is the case. It is the case. It is absolutely correct. Um, the speaker can um, declare that uh, the individual has vacated his or her seat. Um, it is done where um, members uh, may If I may, uh, 35.4 of the Constitution says, OK, once uh, the member is convicted of an offence relating to elections, and if it is open, to the member to appeal, he shall forthwith cease to perform his functions. That's what the Constitution imposes on the member. But he shall not forget his seat until the expiration of a period of 30 days, provided that the Speaker may extend those periods with 30 days up to an aggregate of 150 days. And after that, I think it would have need the, the approval of the House. Um, that is how it is said. So, so 
uh, as far as I can see, there is no way out. Uh, once the person is convicted, then the Constitution says he has to stop performing his functions. You will not vacate, and you can ask the speaker to extend. So the mean the, the seat uh, is not uh, vacant, but uh, he cannot perform his functions as a member. And then he has to appeal and see what comes out of that. Uh, that is how I, I think so. So how then does section 40 or 41D comes in? I'm trying to understand the system. You said the law is the law, that's fine. But apparently, distinguished judges of the Court of Appeal have different opinions of what the law is. Okay, so section 40, firstly, I would like to highlight that the word exclusive does not does not appear in section 40. The word exclusive does not appear, and I it has always, well, it is my submission um, that the word exclusive should not be read in. Um, in the Constitution of Guyana, the word exclusive is used, but not in the Constitution of Dominica. Um, but Section 40 would be engaged um, where there is some ambiguity. Um, so if if it is that um, the it is not sufficiently clear, for example, and the speaker may, um, would not have asked the person to vacate his seat or declare that the, the, prevent the person from sitting in the house. Um, then it would be open um, to an, an individual with sufficient interest to approach the High Court on the Section 41D, um, as was done in the Denzel Douglas case, referred to by the Court of Appeal majority in this case, um, for a declaration that the person has vacated his seat. Um, but on the Section 35.3, which is the, the section engaged, um, if we look at A, it says a member shall also vacate his seat in the house if he's absent from the, sitting, from the sittings of the house for such period and, and in such circumstances as may be prescribed in the rules of procedure of the house. I think this is the section that is most frequently engaged, um, where a, a member does not attend parliament and therefore um, it is vacated. Um, so, so in that sense, um, based on the, the constitution and based on the practice, um, if it is that someone, um, the constitution requires someone to vacate his seat, um, then the speaker has the responsibility of ensuring that this person does not sit in parliament. If there, if this is not done, or if there is some ambiguity, an application can ma be made under Section 41D um, for a declaration from the High Court, because the High Court has jurisdiction under Section 41D to determine these questions. But that is not to say that um, the High Court must deal with all election matters, um, which is a statement which was made in the Loftus um, decision. And in our submissions, um, we are submitting that this decision of the Court of Appeal was, was in erroneous. Um, it expanded um, the topics of Section 40. Um, and as we indicated in the submissions, um, there are cases, even at the highest level of the Caribbean Court of Justice, in um, the Ventos, Eddie Ventos was his chief electoral, electoral officers, uh, officer, officer, and at the Privy Council level in Bransky and Orders versus the Constituency Boundaries Commission. You know, these are cases where the courts at the highest level have dealt cases which involved electoral issues and which were not brought by election petition. So um, I would like to invite the, 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 the CCJ, um, if it so pleases, um, to not follow the decision in the um, loftus Jura um, case, loftus Jura versus the, the president of Dominica. But reading yeah. section 35.4, as I understand it then, it is your submission then that if at some point a magistrate convicts a member of parliament, and in this case, 15 members of parliament, um, once he convicts them, then they shall forth this cease to perform their functions. Um, maybe the seat will not be vacant. Maybe the speaker will keep the, uh, the seat alive, but they will cease to perform their functions. That that sounds like chaos to me. 
Well, Your Honor, um, I would beg to disagree. Um, the Your Honor, the uh, members of parliament, um, if they are found guilty, being found guilty means that you actually committed a criminal offense according to law. So if they have committed this criminal offense, if they are now convicted criminals, um, then under section 44, then they, the, they should cease to perform their functions as members of parliament, um, but um, their seat shall not be vacated until the expiration of 30 days thereafter. Um, those, that is the, these are the clear words in the constitution. Sure, that's what I'm reading. So that means they can receive their salary, but they can't work. No, but, but if is it is that their seats are vacated, then fresh elections would have to be called. So that the the, the seats would be um, filled. Well, they, but they they will not be vacated as long as the speaker extends the thirty days. Uh, anyway, um, I'm just trying to understand the system of the constitution. Yes, but um, my lord, um, the, the the constitution also provides that after the dissolution, there there would be at some point a dissolution of parliament and. The country runs normally after the dissolution of parliament. It is not complete chaos. Um, so it will not be a case where um, there is no government, everything shuts down. After the dissolution of parliament, um, the country runs. There, there's no existence of chaos. So it, it would be some, something similar um, to after the dissolution of parliament. OK. It, it seems a heavy responsibility for the poor magistrate that has to take those decisions. Well, but but that's what it is. It is what Mr. It is. Linford, may I just ask you one question? Is it your opinion that Section 41 does not in its entirety apply to election petitions? So, for example, Section 41D can apply to a variety of other circumstances as enumerated under 35.4 and 33C that have nothing to do with election petitions. But I'm just trying to find out whether you agree. So that is it, because we've been speaking about section 41 in a generic sense and election petitions. My reading of section 41 suggests, and the constitution as you have brought to our attention, uh, 35 and 33, I think, it seems to me that 41 is not only dealing with election petitions, but covers, as the marginal note says, all questions of membership. And therefore, the jurisdiction of the High Court, there is a jurisdiction for election petitions, validity of elections, and we have a, 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 an act for that. But this section 41, when the courts are saying must be read down and so on, is not but I, I, let me not repeat myself. Do you agree or what, what are your thoughts on that? And again, Mr. Astefan, I would like just a short yes or no. Does it or does it not apply? I don't have to have a long answer necessarily. But Your Honor, I agree completely. And um, if we look at Section 41B, for example, it says the High Court shall have jurisdiction to determine any question whether any person has been validly appointed as a senator. There can be no election petition as it relates to appointments to the Senate. Um, so it's only Section 41A that applies to election petitions, but um, B, C, D do not. Um, so yes, we agree. But 41A includes Senator. If you read 41A, yes, yes, both ma'am. to the House or to the Senate. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Um, but um, so I would I would um, rephrase that by saying that it's only half of Section 41A that applies to petition. Um, so it's not election petitions. The only in your electoral system, your general elections appoint people to the House and then the government and the opposition appoint separate numbers to the Senate. And who are, do you have independent senators? Your, um, what is your, how is your Senate made up? Is it just made up of 
persons from the uh, the government and the opposition? I believe that the Senate is made up of only the governments and the opposition. Um, but Just curious that they use the word in A. You see, A is about elections. B is about appointments. Yeah? Yes. Yes, Your, um, Your Honor. Your Honor, the Senate um, is dealt with in Section 34 of the Constitution. Mm, uh, and okay. Yes, it is only um, the government, the prime, well, acting on the advice of the Prime Minister and acting on the advice of the leader of the opposition. Um, but I, I would, I would agree that it is, it is not correct. Um, um, it is not a proper interpretation of Section 40 to say that um, Section 41 deals only with election petitions or to say that um, Section 41 mandates that um, elections should only be questioned through election um, petition. Um, I do not believe that that is a correct interpretation of Section 40. Um, I believe that there have been quite a bit of confusion um, as it relates to Section 40. And I, I think that um, this is an ample opportunity for the Caribbean Court of Justice as the highest court um, in the region um, to clarify the exact scope of Section 40 and whether it is um, that it exclusively gives the High Court in determining election petition matters um, jurisdiction. Okay, thank Shall you. Shall we out of time? Is there anything else left you have for us? Um, Your Honor, I would like to rely on my written submissions as it relates to um, reference to the Wingrove George case. Um, in the High Court and also as it relates to distinguishing um, the cases which were relied on by counsel for the appellant. Um, but I'm grateful for the time allotted to, to me. Um, and th that is the extent of my submissions, unless there are any questions that the court would be would like to pose. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Astafan, do you wish to respond? Yes, yes, my lord. I think I think I need to. Um, let me let me first of all deal with the question of sections thirty five and two and thirty two three and thirty five four. Um, the references to convicted, like in all of these provisions, it's a it's a living document. It's a living document. The constitution was provided an exception or a possibility of convictions by any law that may be paid by, that may be made by parliament that would have permitted either the high court to impose a penalty or a fine or imprisonment or create rather than summary jurisdiction make these these offenses indictable by which they could be punished, um, could try to be convicted in the High Court. We, 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 we say that because we, we maintain, we maintain the arguments that we've made earlier. So but just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. You, you, you're saying that the references in, is it section 32 and 35 of the Constitution to conviction exclude or do not relate to convictions before magistrates in a magistrate's court? Absolutely. I Because it's a 1951 act that did not have any jurisdiction and made no separation between an elected member and a non-member. It was any person in colonial times, his or her majesty were able to pass laws and do what they see fit and have these issues dealt with at the magistrate's court. Come the 1967 Constitution, what our submission is by the sections that my learned friend referred to, that Parliament did not preclude the possibility of prosecution and trial of election members in the High Court or a court of equal jurisdiction to the election court for the purposes of protecting the integrity of the court. I think I respectfully submit it would be a mistake to read those provisions as given constitutional 
protection or, or, or embrace to the House of Assembly Act that vested prior to the coming into the 1967 Constitution, jurisdiction in the magistrate's court. So, so, so we, we, but we when, are, when, when, when the Constitution in 1967 Constitution would have been drafted, the drafters must surely have had cognizance of the fact that there existed criminal offenses on the statute books, which could could be embraced by what was stated in sections 32 and 35. Well, well you're, 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 if, if you are correct, then it, then, then it renders the provisions for the existing laws under sex, sketch, section two of the- Paragraph the two, the second schedule. Paragraph two, redundant. With the greatest all, respect, counsel, 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 how can it render it redundant? It makes it simply that there's no application of the um, CV, uh, of that um, reading down provision, it does not make it redundant. It no, simply means not. that there's not any application of it. No, Your, Your Honor, um, maybe maybe I am misunderstood or I misspoke. What that I'm saying is that when the Parliament, the Constitution, decided to vest the exclusive jurisdiction in the High Court, it is our submission that that removed the jurisdiction from the colonial law that was vested in the magistrate. But that and is, that is, forgive me for interrupting you, but your premise continues to give me the utmost difficulty. You keep saying that um, it was decided to vest the exclusive jurisdiction. Now there is an exclusive jurisdiction given to the High Court in relation to election petitions. But the thesis of the Court of Appeals decision, I'm um, sharing for its submission, is that within that exclusive jurisdiction, there are offenses which are cognizable by the election court, but those offenses are also cognizable by any um, court of law. Well, Your Honor, that, that's, that's where we say the contradiction lies because you're vesting it in the High Court for the purposes of making a finding of guilt, the consequence of which is disqualification. And at the same time saying that it can go to the magistrate for a conviction, which is a finding of guilt with the very same consequence that was vested in the High Court. What and I don't think... That, no, I mean, Your, Your, Your Honor, if we, if we read it literally, then, then perhaps if you read it within the context of the, 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 the policy and the principles governing election law, we are saying that these provisions were referring to conviction in 32.4, 32.3, and 35.4 should be read as a living document that in the event Parliament intends to prescribe criminal acts prosecuted in the High Court by the DPP or, the, or whoever, in, in legislation to be passed or that may be passed in the foreseeable future. We honest I we respectfully submit that it's a it's a it, the, the, if if the constitution is interpreted the way that is being advanced, it leads to a contradiction where anybody can bypass the election jurisdiction of the High Court to ask the magistrate to make the same determination that the High Court is required to make, whether they're guilty of committing the offense with the consequence of, 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 of disqualification. So as advanced by my learned friend and the respondent, you now have two judges, two, two courts, a magistrate's court which could include lay magistrates and the High Court who are protected um, from all sorts of interferences. Mr. Asifan, may I ask you a very precise question? Under 41D of the Constitution, is that necessarily the subject matter of an election petition? Well, the answer to that is 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 very likely not, because well, very likely. <laughs> well, I do. Well, the answer is no. No. Well, exactly. The answer no. is no. Therefore, therefore, to suggest that 41 ipso facto creates an exclusive jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis election petitions 
Maybe you can say that for 41A, maybe, but it cannot be said for 41 in its entirety because an no, easy... Your honor's right. Your honor's right. All I right. am referring to 41A. Right. And therefore, the all of the judgments that were written uh, have overreached insofar as they may have suggested that 41 ipso facto is dealing with election petitions. You agree with that, at least? Yes. All right. Therefore, a criminal charge under this a summary offense can not constitute the subject matter of an election petition, but may constitute the subject matter of 41D. Agreed? No, I don't. So therefore, your argument is broader than what you have told us. What you are basically well, arguing as a policy is 41 in its entirety is removing M elected MPs from the jurisdiction of the Magistrates Court, full stop. Even in relation to 41D uh, uh, bases for disqualification, Correct? They are not no. the subject matter of a petition because they're not going to the validity of an election, but you are saying those also should not be the subject matter of um, the magistrate's no. court. No, your honor, going far broader than I, I have submitted. The, the, but the core of my submission is that once it comes to a corrupt practice, whether it's cheating or bribery, or any of the other corrupt practices that vitiates an election, and I will, I will respond to the question of whether it takes one or two. That determination of that fact of guilt was removed from the magistrate's court and vested in the high court, because the inevitable consequence of both of them is disqualification. And cabinet, the, the parliament, and the constitution must be read in a workable way. But Mr. but Mr. Asifan, sorry to cut across you. Not every concept, not every event that may lead to disqualification may be the subject matter of an election petition. Do you not agree with that? Not in relation not, to a pre not, not, not every not, 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 your honor, not in relation to pre-election matters. No. It We're could be pre, pre it could be during, it could be post. No, that, I respectfully disagree. All right. Dr. Dr. Yeah. Douglas, Dr. Douglas case was a case where the disqualified act occurred after his election and being sworn in. Most of the cases that deal with corrupt practices have occurred prior to the election. And the jurisprudence of, 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 of the CCJ in Ram, as well as in um, Ifran Ali, and in all of the other jurisdictions that we have, our decision, when it comes to making findings of fact or of guilt that affects the result of the election, potentially affect the result of the election, like a conviction in the magistrate's court would lead to, to, to the disqualification, which has the effect of determining that the membership in the parliament was unlawful, should be left in the hands of the high court and not bifurcated or separated or dissected between the summary jurisdiction for the same offense between the magistrate's court and the high court. That, I respectfully submit, is not what was contemplated by the Constitution. And that is why I respectfully submit that these provisions that we've read and relied on should be read as a living document, a living provision that will contemplate up the legislation being passed by the, by, by, the, by, the, by the parliament that would fit within the exception and allow an elected member to be prosecuted in the high court. I mean, the way that we see it, Your Honor, a high court judge will make a determination of guilt, send his report to the president with the consequence of disqualification. All that the magistrate does is to make a finding of guilt with the same consequence, except one includes a penal consequence and the other does not. And we are submitting, respectfully submitting, that to suggest that the two, because a colonial law made reference to any person 
and permitted some reconviction before the introduction of the 1967 Constitution to carry on these colonial concepts into, deliver, into a, 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 a written constitution, would we respectfully submit undermine the fundamental election principles that require questions of guilt and, and, and membership and whether an election was valid or not to be made by the High Court and not by a side win or a consequence of a decision by the Magistrates Court. May I then deal with some of the other issues that came up? This question of discrimination. Our law has a specific provision that prevents discrimination. That is at section 33, 13, subsection 3 of the Constitution, 1276 of 1361. The fact that Parliament may provide a different process, a different process, for persons elected and non or non-elected would never fit within the context of our constitution that has limited discrimination affording people different treatment to different persons attributable wholly or mainly to the respective description of the, by sex, race, place of origin, political opinions, color or creed. As Madam Justice Blenman said, that language does not make the dual process created by the Constitution and, and in fact by the House of Assembly Act, um, a discriminatory law under the provisions of the Constitution. Your Honor, on the question of bribery, I, I heard some statements or comments from, from the bench. The Erigeri case, the Radix Erigeri case, and the Ferdinand Frampton, forgot his name now. Um, Pina judgment makes it very clear using language in the singular and offense is sufficient to set aside an election. An offense is suggest is required. And the, and whether it affects the result of the election or not is totally irrelevant to the commission of a corrupt practice, whether fraud or bribery, or it vicious everything. The only time the court needs to be troubled of, on, uh, about the quantitative test, as was held in the, in the Trinidad Court of Appeal after the, the election before in Trinidad, is if you're making an allegation that the irregularities affected the result of the election. Then clearly then you have to plead and prove the quantitative test. One, so that so that for you, Mr. Asapan, the integrity, the, the, what your category goes to the integrity of the election. In other words, the question of validity, if the integrity is undermined by corrupt practice, that one act of corrupt practice so affects the integrity that it is sufficient to void. Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes, yes, my lord. Sorry. Yes, your honor. Yes, your honor. Corruption, one act of corruption or bribery undermines an entire election in the specific constituency. I don't have to prove a hundred because the opposition's margin of victory was 50. I don't have to do that. One, I could lose by a thousand votes, but I succeed in convincing the High Court. One person took a bribe, and that's the end of the election. And if we really want to talk about convenience for the public, at a lesser burden of standard of proof, not the beyond the reasonable doubt in the magistrate's court, but as has been, but as as it has been said in our courts, the, the civil standard of proof, but the, great, the, the, the more serious the allegation, the higher burden of, 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 proof, of proof that is required. So wait, 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 wait. I'm trying to just take in what, what, what you just said. Um, if in the course of an election petition that candidate X won by a thousand votes, unsuccessful candidate Y, if he establishes that one of those 1,000 votes relates to a circumstance where candidate X literally bought the vote of a particular person, but there is no other allegation in relation to the other 999 votes. You're saying that that voids the election? Absolutely. That's the law. Absolutely, because 
I think Justice Jamada mentioned about the integrity of the election process. One, con one finding by a trial judge. Well, Mr. Asafan, I know what the I know what the literature says, you know, but uh, I would be curious to turn up a case that meets the hypothetical that the president raised. I am very I'm acutely aware of the literature around yes. election petitions. Well, so that so I, that I, 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 I know what I know how the argument goes, but um, it would be nice for you to turn up and send to us a case that meets the hypothetical. Yeah. Well. It can lead to the conviction of criminal behavior, and that may have a consequence. But as to whether or not it vitiates the election, that is a question which turns on the jurisprudence about integrity. But let's not get into that discussion in a reply. Okay, but, but I should point out that Justice Rollins in Frampton and Peanut and, and Chief Justice Morris Davis spoke of um, committed an election offense. It was singular. And the only time they spoke of the quantitative test, Your Honor, is in relation to the irregularities that, that, that may have taken place. Yeah, no, no, I'm aware of it, right? Yes, thank you. Don't, don't, don't labor it, I understand. No, no, I'm going to move on. Um, I dealt with this, Dr. Douglas discrimination. Um, Yes, my learned friend referred to the, the election judgments and corrupt practices that she had cited. And I, 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 I think that we had dealt with that in the law, in the Court of Appeal, by pointing out that the, I don't remember the facts, but that the, 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 the constitutional framework was not the same as ours. And I think Madam Justice Blendon may have said so in her judgment as well. And I mean, that, that's important. Um, on the issue, my last point, Your, your, your Honor, on the question, two, two, min two minor points, two minor points, my Lord. My learned friend referred to Section 68 of the Act and spoke of the 28-day payments. And at any time a payment is, is discovered, you have 28 days to, 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 to be. That's not the complaint that was filed. The complaints that were filed, the complaints that were filed are found in, in the bundle. I just referred to one at page 427 of 618. And it was all of them restricted at page 428 as well of 618. There are a lot of them, there are 15 of them. All concern the holding of an election Sorry, the holding of a fet, a party, a dance, a free concert, two of them before the election. All right, the complaints actually says this did aforesaid work together to corruptly, directly, and or indirectly influence the results by engaging in their lawful act of treating, whereby on the 28th of November they held a, a free concert. Um, for the purpose of corruptly influencing the Dominican electorate. On the 6th of November, another another party, Morgan Heritage for the Port. There was no allegation of money. There was no allegation of payment of any money. And therefore, the, 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 the ability to go beyond the 20, 21 or 28 days would, would not apply. The final point is the, the question of, of disruption. Unless, unless, unless I, I was misunderstood. My use of the word disruption and so was intended to fit, was intended to fit the the the, elect, the election principles of expedition and certainty and the issue of legitimacy that was read that was that was mentioned by um, this court in RAM and also by Justice just Justice Rollins in, in the Fra in the Frampton case. And that that issue of disruption was the, the election slash constitutional policy of having a strict time limit for the purposes of 
election. Now, my final point does not arise as an issue of law or as an issue of... Um, but my learned friend's reference to the politicians on the opposition who are members of the parliament being charged. That is a perfect example of minister of members of parliament being able to be charged by the state for unlawful or alleged criminal acts that do not involve the election process or the election campaign prior to. So if any of the 15 appellants were to commit similar acts, alleged acts of incitement or whatever have you, I have no doubt that the police and the DPP would be able to charge them as the leader of the opposition was charged. So I am very grateful for that comparison. I, unless there's somebody else I can assist you, you will, uh, Your Honor, these are, my, these are our submission. Unless I missed the question that was put to me during a learned friend submission. The modification issue. Uh, uh, are oh, you yes. of the view that, that uh, the treating offense needs to be modified, and if so, in, in what respect? Well, I think, what, I think what the learned trial judge did, if I may start there, he says, look, they're being charged for the same act that the court, the election court is, an, is, is, is obliged to hear and determine, which is the language of section 40 because it affects the result, it affects the validity of the election. And in that way, she removed, she removed the, the elected members from the jurisdiction of the magistrate's court and said, to the extent that it is an allegation of a corrupt practice, it is for the high court to determine. To that extent, she did a jurisdictional modification. Um, the corrupt practices, as it stands now, subject to any proposed amendments, um, can stand as is. What, what, what we are concerned about is the jurisdiction for hearing and determining, which is the language used of Section 40, hearing and determining whether somebody was validly elected. And we are saying to that extent in the 1967 and the 1978 Constitution, the House of Assembly Election Act, which is a colonial law, needs to be modified to vest that jurisdiction that would cause somebody to be disqualified following a conviction in the magistrate's court to be vested in the high court. That would be, that would be, and it's there, it would then be a matter for, 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 for the parliament to make a decision in accordance with 32.3 and 32.4 whether in fact and in, under what circumstances could could uh, could um, an elected member be prosecuted and charged for for offenses con con connected with the election process? It it could not possibly be allowed to be left in the hands of the magistrate because you have two concurrent um, avenues or options both with the same consequence. That could never have been the contemplation of the parliament, could never have been of the constitution, I'm sorry, despite the language in 32.3 and 35.4. These are to be given a living, a living document interpretation. So an MP, it should not be possible for an MP to face in a criminal proceeding, an election offense. The With, without, without, without any, without any amendment at this time. Yes. If an MP is suspected of having committed a, a criminal, a, a, an election offense, then currently the only remedy is to proceed by way of election petition. Yes, and I have no doubt when the, the, the law reform hearing start that my learned friend, uh, Ms. Schillingford, 
um, and I will be before the commission to say, look, you need to extend the 21 days. It's really too short. And you need to expressly provide for prosecution of elected members um, in the House, but in a jurisdiction that matches the jurisdiction of the election court that has the authority to disqualify, to, to make findings of guilt that will disqualify them. So, Mr. you see, Mr. Asafan, that, that, that's what I want to clarify, because the president raised the question with you in the context of election petitions. But in fact, your submission really is the magistrate's jurisdiction to convict someone that can lead, meaning an MP, that can lead to disqualification is out with the Constitution, Section 41. And that is despite the language of 35.4 and 32.3. Your real point is... The, the entire jurisdiction of the magistrate's court to convict, you call it a colonial law, to convict someone, an MP, if that conviction can lead to disqualification, is outwit the Constitution. Is that what your submission is? When you say outwit, what do you mean? Me, me, not... meaning, meaning it's outside, it, it is unconstitutional then. It is it is, it yes, is inconsistent it, with the it, Constitution. It, it conflicts with Section 41A. Yes, but I'm saying it's not limited to election elections. It is any jurisdiction because 41 deals with all kinds of disqualification. When I listened to you, you answered the president, but you said, even in your last comments, what you have to do is any offense for which there can be a criminal prosecution that can lead, and you keep using the word disqualification, which is not limited to elections, should be done in the high court to bring it no, in alignment. I, I restrict it. Your, honor, your honor's quite right. I, I'm over. Well, you're I saying think. two different things. You see, on yeah, one no, hand, I, you are painting a, with a very broad brush saying, look, any jurisdiction in the magistrates that can lead to a conviction, that can lead to any disqualification, is outwit. No. Ultra, no. No, 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 no. I, I want to be very clear. What, what, they, because there are clearly provisions, like the Dr. Douglas case, which came by constitutional motion, because that was a post-election disqualifying fact. What we are saying, pre-election of cor offenses of corrupt practices, I am focused only on these corrupt practice of treating and bribery and others that have only pre-election, uh, only alleged pre-election offenses that can invalidate an election, not disqualification, that can invalidate an election. That's what you want to say. Yes, disqualification is too broad. I take your point now. All right. That's Let me just make a note because, yeah, thank you. Because we are concerned only with corrupt pre-election corrupt practices now and no other form of disqualification. Thank you. And I use the word disqualified because that is, is the consequence of the conviction or the report by the High Court judge. Yes. So if I misled you, I'm, 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 I'm sorry about that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Asifan. Um, I don't believe subject to any word from my colleagues that we have anything further. Um, I would ask you and counsel on the other side to just stay on the stay on the line, so to speak, for a period of about five or ten minutes. Um, we are going to have a little discussion amongst the judges and then we will come back and let you know uh, how we propose to dispose of the proceedings. So just give us five or ten minutes.
Um, yes, uh, Mr. Asisan, um, the Shillingford, uh, having heard the submissions, the court will reserve its judgment in this matter and um, the deputy registrar or the registrar will let you know at an appropriate time, it would certainly be in the new year when we would deliver our reserve judgment. We thank you for your submissions and um, we will consider them. So thank you very much. Um, Madam Deputy Registrar, you may close the proceedings. Much obliged, Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable President Saunders. Thank you, Honorable Judges. Thank you, Council. Thank you, staff of the Caribbean Court of Justice. This court now stands adjourned.